This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To Wrestling Omakase. It is episode number 242. And this week it is January 1st, 2022. Uh, so we're here for our annual, our fifth annual, cannot believe it's been five already, uh, Wrestling Omakase Awards episode, our award spectacular. And we have eight guests this time, all who appeared on the show in 2021 and all voted uh, in the 2021 awards. So Really quickly, just to quickly explain the awards before, um, you know, for new newer listeners before I get into introducing everybody. So we do these awards every year. Um, it is a closed poll open to all the Wrestling Omakase guests who appeared on the show during that calendar year. So since we obviously rotate guests every week or every episode on the show, uh, you know, that was an idea I came up with all the way back in the first year in 2017. So if you are a guest in that calendar year, and that will, this, including this episode, uh, there's one guest in particular uh, who can identify himself, I guess, when I introduce him, who always gets a ballot because he always appears on the, on the award show and uh, it just keeps going like that. Um, but yeah, so if you appeared on any show during the year, including this one now, this will get you a ballot for 2022, uh, you get a ballot for that year and you vote on the best and worst of the year. So we had uh, a ton of people vote, well, actually a little less than uh, some past years, but about should have counted beforehand. I think it was like 25 people voted this year, uh, maybe 26, including me. And, you know, everybody voted for their best and worst of the year. Uh, and it's a format very similar to the Wrestling Observer uh, Newsletter Awards. Uh, you know, I kind of take the awards from there. But, you know, more, less categories overall than they have. You know, there's some categories I don't really give a shit about, like uh, best DVD or best book or whatever. We don't have that. But we have some Category A awards uh, where everybody votes for their top three and the points are awarded on a 5-3-2 basis with uh, the number of first place votes being the tiebreaker. And then Category B awards where you're only picking your uh, one winner. So it's just the total number of votes that's the winner. And that's a lot of the worst categories are like that where we have uh, only you only vote for one thing because people barely like voting for anything for worse. They definitely don't want to vote for their top three uh, <laughs> worst in anything. But yeah, so that's how the awards work uh, before I introduce all the guests. Uh, and this, like I said, is our fifth year doing these, and it's always a fun time uh, going through the best and worst of the year. So let me introduce our first guest. Uh, but I, So if you want to read off, if you remember what episode you appeared on, you're welcome to do that. I don't actually, I didn't write that down. But uh, <laughs> first of all, we have Devin back on. Hi, Devin. Hey, I would totally just go through my worst for hours, but um, <laughs> I was in on July for Gleet and the King of DDT finals. Actually, I do have it written down. I lied. Yeah. And, and then, then also for the no one. for the G1 yeah. opening night and a All Japan Quark. And that no, no, no. It was at Noah N1 opening night. N1 opening night. Yeah. No, I said G1, but I said yeah. Noah. Yeah, Noah N1 opening night and All Japan Quark. And yep, so you made two appearances this year. Uh, and you're here on the on your first ever award show. My second appearance was actually filling in for Paul. Oh, that's true, actually. So Krauss Noya. Paul, Paul is also on the episode. Uh, but welcome back, Devin. Anything you want to say about 2021 before we get into the awards? Did you like I the got, year? I actually liked the year. I had COVID, though, at the end of it, so that kind of sucked. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I hope you feel better. It does suck. I'm getting there. Uh, up next, we have a Om- uh, Omakase veteran appeared on the show many times and a voice of wrestling contributor. Uh, this year appeared on the show looks like four times, uh, including a five matches episode, the New Japan Cup pick uh the Russell Grand Slam in Tokyo Dome, and the G1 Finals is Mr. Sean Cedor. Hi, Sean. Sean, you got to unmute yourself. Oh. Okay. No, that's all right. I thought you were going to unmute me. Everyone, but, uh... I can't unmute you. I can only mute you. So. All right. All right. That's all right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, doing good. Uh, just came back from watching a Penn State ball game where we lost, sadly. But uh, excited to uh, record the show with you and uh, talk about the best of 2021 and some of the worst, too. Uh, what did you think of the year, Sean? Did you have a good year? I guess in wrestling or in general. I don't know. Um. It was better than 2020. I'll just say that. Here's what I, 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 my year was way better than 2020, but I guess spoiler alert for my best and worst awards. I thought this was way worse than 2020 when it came to pro wrestling. Um, yeah, I just thought it was like the worst year of wrestling in over a decade, honestly. But well, I, I, I did get to go to two big AEW shows in September. So I guess for me, in that respect, it was a, it was a decent year for me. Which you went to all out and the... no, I, I went to uh, Dynamite in Newark and then uh, uh, Arthur Ashe. Yeah, I was at Arthur Ashe. I was not in Newark, but all right, Sean. Uh, I don't, also, you're making an echo for some reason. Uh, up next, we have the the person I was talking about. His one and only appearance of 2021 was on the 2020 award, <laughs> year end awards episode, uh, and now he's back here for the to earn his ballot for 2022. With the 2021 Year End Awards episode it is Mongo underscore ebooks. Hello, Mongo. Hello, and now that I've appeared, I can log off, and I'll see you next year. <laughs> there you go. But uh, yeah, I especially this year, I just haven't watched enough like of a promotion like other than AEW to really justify like being on a show to talk about it because yeah. CMLL is bad. I gave up on New Japan in the summer. I haven't really been able to get into any of the uh, the cyber agents, and I watch like Stardom every few months to like catch up on things. So, except at the end of the year, I'm just a bad guest. But it was a good year <laughs> overall. There you go. Uh, also back on the show from Voices of Wrestling. Uh, let's see, what you appear? You appeared on the 2020 Year End Awards, also uh, the New Japan Cup Pick'em. And the 2021 Mid-Year Awards. You may be the only person that was on the... Oh, no, TJ actually did the Year-End Awards and the Mid-Year Awards. He's not here today, though. Uh, but yes, it's Suit Williams back on the show. Hi, Suit. Hello, hello. Doing well. I would say my 2021... I mean, honestly, I don't remember much of it. But, <laughs> you know... It I feels like it was the... 10, 10 years in one. Uh, like I did get... To... Yeah. I did get to see uh, two AEW pay-per-views, which was fun. And I'm getting closer to being done with this portion of my schooling. So when did you, what paper did you go to? What paper did you go to? I went to Double or Nothing and Um, then I went to All Out. And I totally did not know you went to Double or Nothing. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I I would have guessed All Out because it seems like. Yeah, I was going to say, I would have guessed All Out because, like, everyone in Voice of Wrestling went to All Out. But, like, you were, yeah, that was the one where your flight kept getting canceled because, like, New Orleans was getting slammed by COVID, right? No, we got slammed by a hurricane. Oh, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was not, in... the, not the plague, the uh, <laughs> the global, the climate change-fueled uh, extreme weather. It's my bad. Yeah. Uh, we were in Alabama for a minute. Then there was, a, like, tornado warnings over there. Then I had to just move my flight around, but it all worked out because I got like three flight credits, and I may go to Revolution. So there you go. There you go. It all works. What was Revolution again? Orlando or something? Orlando, yes. Okay, I, I would not would not be that that into going to Florida right now, but <laughs> I mean, I that guess. is true. <laughs> Whatever. I went um, already, so yeah. If it happens, I mean, I'm getting. Happens. I'm I'm supposed to get on a plane for Vegas tomorrow, so I guess I shouldn't talk. But uh, thanks for coming back on suit. Up next, we have Gerard, who appeared on... Wow, you appeared on a lot of shows, buddy. Wow. The 2020 Year-End Awards, the 2000s Furo Draft, 
the Noah, like three, we did like a triple Puro show, Noah, New Japan, DDT, uh, the Champion Carnival Finals, uh, All Japan World Road Tournament, and All Out Preview, uh, the G1, and like, so yeah, one, two, three, five episodes. Uh, well, thank you, Gerard, first of all, <laughs> but uh, welcome back to the show for the year end awards. Would you, how, how was your 2021? Uh, well, I've uh, mostly cured my hangover, so that's gone, so I'm ready. Um, but uh, yeah, 2021 was actually, uh, I would say, a pretty good year. I actually like mixed things up a lot, and I watched probably more DDT this year than I ever have before. And I watched a lot of uh, Joshi outside of stardom as well. So, I mean, I think I at least managed to find some, I at least managed to have a fun 2021, I think. Yeah, well. That's good. <laughs> I mean, I, I definitely didn't when it comes to wrestling, at least. But uh, thanks for coming back on. And then we have Mr. Liam McCann. Uh, let's see. What episodes did you appear on? Just one, actually. We did Dominion. Is that wait? Is that you? There's three Liams. I think that's you. Dominion and Cyberfight Festival. Yes. No. no oh, OK. Care. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's Liam Jones. My bad. Yeah. So you did... We did Wrestle Kingdom. Oh. Wrestle Kingdom and G1 Night 9 and the Victory Finals. Okay. There's yep. three Liams. How the fuck did three different Liams? <laughs> That's not that common of a name, right? I mean, like, maybe it well, is in certain parts of the world. I don't know. I actually heard that um, in, like, 2012, 2013, it was the most popular name for new wow. kids in the U.S. So it's go. rising popularity, but I don't know if it's a popular name in terms of 20-something Puro fans. <laughs> But yes, uh, welcome back to the show. Thank One you. of three, the only of the three Liams who came on the show. So, who came wow. on this award show? <laughs> I would say one. Of, whole, you could actually do a whole Liam roundtable for. We the could band. do a Liam <laughs> roundtable. Well, the problem is Liam. So Liam Byrne uh, it, it did not submit a ballot because he only does retro stuff, which is understandable. Uh, Liam Jones did submit a ballot and just did not want to appear. So, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, disgraceful. <laughs> but uh there you go and how do you like 2021 Liam? so i started the year with a shattered leg um facing oh, amputation yeah, yeah i um was you know thinking that this year was gonna be really tough so i had to relearn how to like relearn how to walk completely doubted my status as a shindy hon freak um you know it's been up and down up and down let's say there you go uh well hopefully it's more up than down next year buddy or this year, I guess now, it's now 2022. Finally, we have Paul uh, coming back on the show here. Let's see what episodes you appeared on, Paul. Uh, you did... Oh, let's see. You did three episodes... No, four episodes. I'm sorry. You did the New Beginning in Nagoya, uh, Castle Attack. <laughs> okay. Uh, Champion Carnival Night 3 and DET April Fool, and then the 2021 Mid-Year Awards. So... Thank, first of all, thank you, Paul, for doing four episodes. And uh, second of all, welcome back. And how was your 2021? Uh, hey, John. Yeah. No, I'm happy. I actually probably would have been five if I hadn't just completely destroyed my voice. before. Oh, yeah. I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I had to get the, the last minute guest. Yeah. And that's what no, I was just talking about. Yeah. No, but my 2021, it was a weird year. Like, I was moving around a lot and everything. Like, I lived in two different countries, basically. Uh, but I mean, I kind of settled everything kind of, I suppose, by the middle of the year. And then had quite an exciting second half of the year where I went to Chicago by way of Istanbul to get around the travel ban and went all out. And that was really a ton of fun. And I loved seeing everyone there. Yeah, it's, it does sound awesome. Um, but yeah, so as I was, I, was, I was talking about, I guess, I thought this was a horrible year for wrestling. So I had a really hard time uh, picking out, you know, you know, what my best of the year was, especially, I mean, it, it just really, you know, by the end of the year, as people listening to this podcast probably know, since we've done so many retro roulette episodes, I really have not been watching much current wrestling. Uh, I just really have not been into anything Japan's been doing. Uh, I mean, I thought AEW had a good year, but I mean, that's just never going to be my favorite style of wrestling. So, you know, I mean, I remember when I tweeted this out, that I thought this was like the worst year for wrestling for me personally, at least since like 2011, I had people, you know, being like, what the hell are you talking about? This year was great. And it's like, if you really love American wrestling and you really love AEW, I totally get why you thought this year was great. But I, I think people listening will know that's not really me. So, you know, uh, it's just not, I, I did not like it this year really from any Japanese promotion. And 
you know, I just didn't, it, I kind of fell out of all of it. But 2022 is a new start. Going to jump back into everything uh, once I get back from my trip. And, you know, because I'm flying out tomorrow to Vegas to see a couple hockey games. And I'm hoping, um, you know, that 2022 is a better. I mean, hopefully, first of all, the crowds will be allowed to make fucking noise at some point. Uh, that would be really nice. But we'll see, you know, how the year goes otherwise. Uh, okay. But before we can get into 2022, obviously, we got to get through 2021. So let's go through our 2021 Omakase Awards. Uh, now, if you listen to these episodes before, you know how we're going to do it here, but we'll start with the category B. So we'll go backwards and do all the worst categories first. And we'll try not to be spend too much time on these uh, since obviously nobody really likes hearing people just complain about things. Uh, we'll start out with the worst weekly TV show. Uh, so these category B awards, again, everybody's only making one pick. So we'll start with you, Paul. What did you vote for? Worst weekly TV show of 2021. So as worst weekly TV show, I voted for NWA Power. Uh, it was one of the harder categories because I just don't really watch bad weekly TV, but I did at least give Power a little bit of a try and it was just completely awful and it dropped it relatively quickly. So easy pick for worst weekly TV show. All right, there you go. Liam, what'd you put here for worst weekly television program? I can only really vote for something I've watched at least one episode of, one full episode of. And so in that spirit, I am voting for AEW Dark. Uh, what? So why did you not like Dark, I guess? Because yeah. it's it's a completely inessential, you know, filler show with, you know, 15 matches a show that goes hours and hours. And I'm just like, it's the antithesis of anything I like in wrestling. There you go. Uh, some people love the squash matches. I will say when I, when I went to a few... Um, this would, I guess, be dark elevation, not dark. But when I went to it, these AEW tapings, it's the the uh, the squash matches do feel endless. And it's just like, okay, <laughs> I should have gone out. I should go back out and get another beer, I guess, because yeah, I'm not that into the squashes. Some people love the squashes, though. So brevity feel? is brevity is the essence of wit, or something like that. Somebody else voted for dark, by the way. So it wasn't just you. So to get it got two votes for worst TV show. <laughs> Uh, Gerard, what did you vote for worst weekly TV show? Uh, well, I thought this was pretty easy. Uh, NXT 2.0. Uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory and it's become a big running joke. It did have like one of the most racist segments I've ever seen uh, in wrestling history, which is saying something for wrestling uh, or at least recent wrestling history with that, uh, with, you know, <laughs> what's the name of that woman? The, God. Io Shirai. Not Io Shirai, obviously. Zoe no Stark. Horror. Thank you. Oh, the suit, <laughs> suit thing? Yeah, suit no, jumping no. in. Like, I don't know who Io Shirai is. The, yes, <laughs> Io Shirai's partner. I should have just said Io Shirai's partner, obviously. But yeah, Io Shirai and Zoe Stark uh, eating sushi, where the the punchline is that, um, <laughs> that like, well, first of all, Zoe Stark is acting like Io Shirai is a crazy person for eating raw fish, which is like this segment was clearly like was written by either Vince McMahon or Bruce Pritchard or something. You cannot tell me because who on earth is like raw fish? Oh, like they set, they serve that at gas stations now. That is not a, an exotic food to anyone who lives in America. My grandmother is eating sushi. It's like not exactly an exotic food at this point. And then the ultimate punchline while she's acting like Io Shirai is some kind of crazy person for, you know, eating uh, sushi is Zoe Stark assumes that Io Shirai and the uh, and the Asian waitress know each other because all Asians know each other. And wouldn't you know, they do know each other. And it's just like, so the punchline is Zoe Stark is right. All Asians know each other. And it was, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably not even doing it justice. It was just, when I watched the segment, I was just like, how the fuck did this make television in 2020 or I 2021? Think, I think technically didn't that happen before the 2.0 rebrand? Oh, maybe it did. But we have plenty like of more. Before. We have plenty of more Asian stereotypes with jacket time of Juro and Kushida, though. So that's it was though when Vince took over because Triple H had the heart attack. So Vince did write it. Okay. Yeah. But uh, it sucked. <laughs> I guess is the point. Uh, but yes, thanks, Gerard. Uh, Suit. What do you have here for worst weekly TV show? Okay, so I voted for Raw. It was very bad. Um, I did this like two weeks ago. 
I think I would change my vote now to 205 Live because it lo- because if you look at a 205 Live preview, it looks like an eFed. It's just a bunch of people you've never heard of in weird WWE speak. Like, mm, wow. And then they had that um, really bad Lash Legend match, which it that's just mean that they put that on air. That was really bad. But you voted for Raw. I did. <laughs> Raw is my vote. It deserves it, to be honest. Uh, Mongo, what did you vote here for Worst Weekly TV Show? So my Worst Weekly TV Show uh, philosophy is that it should probably be a show that I don't want to watch every week. I don't watch a full episode of. And I voted for NXT because... A, before the uh, 2.0 rebrand, it was already really bad because you had Samoa Joe brought back as champion who then relinquishes the belt in a like a Twitter p- tweet, uh, a video tweet. And then uh, you, you have the entire cross reign before that and Raquel G- Raquel's uh, reign like falling apart and just the show. just Everything I would see about that show was very bad before the summer. And then NXT 2.0 is... It is what it is. You have like a 10 minute single poker hand segment. You have jacket time. You have all of these terrible gimmicks, just the worst mid 90s WWF style gimmicks. And it's all cons- it's all distilled into my uh, my phone in like two minute uh, videos that I can watch uh, when people like uh, DM them to me instead of actually watching every week because that would be horrible. Not to cut in too much, but the single poker hand segment ended with the guy with the better hand folding, despite it only being one hand. Yes. <laughs> so that that actually like influences my vote here a lot because I saw like someone linked me to a video of that. And I'm like, I am not watching ten minutes of this. I skipped to nine minutes in and see the end of that. And I'm like, oh my God, this is so bad. As someone who used to make a living playing poker, this is like bad on that level, but it's just a bad segment in general because I can't imagine what the other nine minutes are. And then the next day, I'm like, I need to know what these other nine minutes are. So I go back and I start watching it and I realize that 10 minutes is that entire hand. And I just, I could not believe it. Could not believe it. Sounds pretty horrible. <laughs> and then I know I never heard of this poker hand thing, but it sounds horrible. Uh, Sean, worst weekly television show. Uh, I will say that I've liked the diversity of the pick so far, but uh, I went pretty chalk and I went with Monday Night Raw. Um, just WWE is bad, and three hours of WWE weekly TV is even worse. So it's a pretty easy choice every single year. Devin, worst weekly TV. I went with Raw just because. It's three fucking hours. Yeah. It's all WWE shit, but this is the most shit at once. So uh, so I also voted for Monday Night Raw. I mean, it's just like, as much as I wanted to be exotic or whatever, whenever I saw any segment on Raw uh, on Twitter or saw like, you know, just happened to turn it on out of really complete boredom and usually turn it off within 15 minutes, it is just completely unwatchable. And... I'm not one of these people that thinks Raw and SmackDown are equally bad. I was able to watch SmackDown for a little while this year, at least without like, you know, I, ha- I haven't been watching it since like September, probably. But I do think SmackDown's better. And NXT, I don't know. I guess that was another contender, but I definitely thought Raw was worse. Uh, the results here. So I should mention, I'll give the more detailed results on the voicewrestling.com website. But the top three we have for all for all categories, I should say. For the top three here, we had NWA Power in third with four votes, NXT in second with six votes, and winning for the fourth straight year since we in- introduced this award in 2018. wasn't in the first year. Uh, Raw is War, <laughs> WWE Raw, with 12 votes. So it doubled up second place. So everybody still hates Monday Night Raw a lot, I guess. That is the winner by a landslide. All right, so our next category here will be the worst major show. And this time I will start. So I voted for WWE SummerSlam August 21st in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, I should say I did not see almost any WWE pay-per-views this year besides, in full at least, besides this show, SummerSlam, and both nights of WrestleMania. And I thought WrestleMania was pretty good. I liked WrestleMania. So they really wasn't even in the running for this award. Uh, 
so some, but SummerSlam on the other hand was absolutely fucking horrible. Um, just the obviously the Becky Lynch, uh, you know, nine second win, beating uh, Bianca Belair was horrible. The Alexa Bliss versus uh, oh my Alexa device went off for that. Should tell her not to do that. Uh, the Miss Bliss versus uh, uh, Ava Marie match was absolutely horrible. I thought the main event was very overrated. Um, that Goldberg Bobby Lashley match was really horrible. It's just a, a horrible drag of a show with only really uh, Edge versus Seth Rollins. You know, that was an awesome match. It almost kind of saved it, but not when that show was so long and everything else was so bad. The only other shows I even considered voting for was uh, AEW Revolution, which I thought was pretty bad, uh, especially with the interference in every single fucking match on that show. But what it really came down to was I liked Moxley versus Kenny more than I liked Edge versus Rollins. So both shows I thought had one great match. And even with the finish to the barbed wire match, I thought, uh, you know, that was better. So SummerSlam was the worst major show of the year for me. What do you have here as worst major show, Devin? I haven't watched more than like 15 minutes consecutively of WWE since 2015. So I couldn't in all consciousness vote for them. So I actually went with the show I watched from front to back. And I went with Castle Attack Night One. A horrible. That would be my third my third place if we were doing three shows, honestly. Yeah, because it's not so much that it was a bad B show. It was a bad B show in their second most prestigious venue, the yeah. Osaka Castle Hall, that had like one good match. It had Jay White versus Ishii, which I liked more than you did, but everything else was just like, oh God, that was like God single matches. And yeah, I just couldn't deal with it. Yeah, it was horrible. Uh, Sean? What'd you have here for worst major show? So this one was a little hard for me just because I, to be completely honest, I really couldn't remember anything. I don't know if it, if some of the stuff was just bad enough that I just wanted to uh, just forget about it. Um, so I ultimately went with, I guess, recency bias and picked WWE survivor series. Uh, the whole brand versus brand concept is something that I think could work if done well, they WWE never has done it well, and it's now to the point where this show just feels just incredibly inconsequential. And I didn't think, I guess there's maybe I don't even remember what the matches were on that show, but I didn't remember anything particular that stood out as bad. It was just more this show is entirely like nothing matters, and it's just a giant waste of of uh, everybody's time. So uh, I went with Survivor Series of. This, I guess, this last November. Uh, Mongo, worst major show. So, my worst major show, I guess, technically, is 12 shows or something in one, but GCW's Fight Forever from last January was a 24 hour marathon. I'm counting it as one show, and anyone who watched it would have to consider it as the worst show because. There were constant technical issues. I think there was like a 45 minute delay at one point. Stuff just like kept going wrong. Um, And there weren't very many good matches. You, You had, I don't know, I probably saw like three matches in the hours and hours I watched that were like, I don't know, three and a half star level stuff. But the, the absolute peak of this show was Jordan Oliver and Tony Deppen went to a, an hour draw. And it was not a very good hour draw. So because they went to an hour draw, they decided that they would settle this with another hour added on to the match. And this hour was the worst, most boring, just god-awful stuff you can imagine. And it goes to another hour draw. So what we had was a two-hour draw in an empty building where you had already well i don't even remember where this was on the show i think it was like 16 or 17 hours in like it was the next afternoon and it was just god awful somehow this wasn't my worst match of the year but it did make this show the worst show of the year um so yeah uh gcw fight forever uh just one of the most astoundingly bad things ever also another bad thing since each of these things was broken into like one or two hour segments you'd have shows that were just like 
an hour where you have a three minute match that isn't very good, an eight minute match that isn't very good, and then another eight minute match that isn't very good. And in the middle, you'd have all of these like ad like they're not even like ad i remember breaks. the ads i remember the ads they were oh horrible. god it was just <laughs> the, the worst production you could imagine so that's my worst show can i can i blow your mind this fight forever got three different votes <laughs> you voted for it worst major show somebody else voted for it for worst major show and somebody voted for it second place for best major show i, I don't like that person <laughs> whoever it is i really i don't like that person <laughs> There you go. They they're uh, probably one of the people who made the uh the Depp and Jordan Oliver match rated uh let's see what is it on it's rated a 7.5 on Cage Match. 7.5. Wow. Astounding. Yeah. That means they gave it like three and a quarter. Weird. Um oh no, no. That means they gave it sorry, what am I talking about? That means they gave it like three and three quarters. Okay. Uh <laughs> suit. What do you have here for worst major show? Uh, Sean already said it. Survivor Series 2021. A show so bad I bailed on the review early so I could watch Steeler football. And if you've seen the Steelers play this year, you know that's not a good thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Gerard, I'm oh, sorry, you got more to say about Survivor Series too? Oh no, I was just going to say a completely useless show, a waste of everyone's time, and most importantly mine. Gerard, worst major show for 2021? Uh, so I went with NXT War Games uh, from December 5th. I thought it was awful and, and just exposed how green all the talent were. Uh, the women's War Games wasn't very good at all. And the men's War Games I also thought was awful, even though some people seem to really like it. But it just exposed some of the like uh, very... like green people in that too there was only one good match which was the imperium versus kyle o'reilly and von wagner tag team title match but that couldn't save the show and then there was that also that awful uh roderick strong versus joe gacy for the cruiserweight title match and that whole stupid feud around it so i know it just encapsulated everything that's so bad with nxt 2.0 uh liam worst major show Lots of choices this year. Lots of choices. Um, I also voted for New Japan Castle Attack Night 1, putting 1,800 people into a Psycho Joe Hall, having humdrum, boring as shit singles matches, and having one person on the show put in any form of discernible effort in his effort to carry Tomohiro Ishii. Fuck, guys. That was a a rough one. Uh, Paul, worst major show? Yeah, so hey, I'm the other person that voted GCW Fight Forever as the worst major <laughs> show. Uh, yeah, I can really just kind of echo what Mongo has already said about the show. It was just completely awful. And that that Deppen versus Jordan Oliver matches the stuff of nightmares. Like putting Jordan Oliver, first of all, in an Ironman match, an hour long Ironman match, is already a bafflingly stupid decision. But then to have him go two hours just. I think I somehow made it through the first hour and I think when they actually started going extra and it was quite clear that they were going another hour, I just turned off the show in disgust and yeah, just very easily the worst show. Like cool concept in theory was just horrible execution. Uh, Seven people gave that Jordan Oliver match nine out of 10 on cage match. <laughs> and someone gave it a full 10. Wow. And the guy who gave it a full 10 is the person who reviews every freedom show just to shit on the death matches. Okay. <laughs> That's dedication. <laughs> uh, so here is what, uh, here's what we got for the final results. Uh, a tie for third survivor series, which we already went over that got three votes and then crown jewel uh, from October 21st in Riyadh also got three votes. I think people vote for crown jewel just because it's the Saudi show. Cause I heard the show was actually good this year. Not that I'd ever watch it, but uh, yeah, it always always gets votes because it's like you know WWE is doing blood money show, so you know people just vote for it because they're not going to watch they're not they don't watch WWE, but they're like let me just vote for that because it's really gross. The winner was a tie as well, so tie for first. New Japan Castle Tag Night One and WWE SummerSlam, uh, they both tie for first with four votes each. So technically, WWE wins this award for the fifth straight year, but uh, this time New Japan also claims co-winner. So there you go. Uh, up next, we have the WWE Memorial Award for Worst Promotion. So 
Uh, WWE runs away with this award every fucking year. They, the first year we did it, you know, there was a close ever came to not winning. They had 11 votes and they still won by six votes. Uh, AAA was in second with five votes that year in 2017. After that, 2018, 34 votes. 2019, 24 votes. 2020, 26 votes. Nothing else finished even in, you know, double digits. So I was like, well, what will happen now if uh, we ban them from this award only? Uh, but on the other hand, I'll still let people vote for the sub brands if they want to. And in general, I let people vote for sub brands for best and worst promotion uh, if they wanted to, instead of just having to vote for, uh, you know, the main promotion. So you can probably already tell where this went uh, for worst promotion, since uh, obviously they were eligible. Who you, you know? Who is they? You'll find out in a second, probably. But Paul, who'd you vote for here for worst promotion? So my vote for worst promotion goes to CMLL. Just an incredibly boring promotion. Uh, it's just the same 12 people put into like random six-man tags every single show. Just booking that is basically determined by like throwing darts at a wall instead of actually building storylines. It's just people get put into random teams and they've kind of even like run the whole like heel face split into the ground where like pretty much every match now is like a reveals incredible match where like heels and faces team with each other and it's just like one thing I will give them credit for is that the anniversary show was halfway decent but again the anniversary show shows used to be like one of the biggest shows in all of wrestling that got a lot of buzz and it got nothing this year like and it was a it was an okay show at best so for me CMLL there's a lot of potential there, but again, it just falls short of it every single time. Uh, Liam, what do you have here for worst promotion? I watched a lot of very scummy pure. I've watched multiple 2AW shows this year. Um, so my answer to this question is all of it wrestling. <laughs> Why did you vote for AW? I just, I just fucking hate American wrestling, and I think this... Yeah, it's just, I find AEW just to be WWE light. And so I watched, I watched all the pay-per-views eventually and I'm just so turned off and don't understand the hype. So well, that's why. There you go. Uh, I will find say I found it funny, given obviously that most people disagree. New Japan did not get any votes for worst promotion this year, but AEW did get a vote. And I think most people would say AEW was, was much better, but uh, there you go. I mean, New Japan has gotten votes for worst promotion in many other years. And this year, where I thought was probably their worst year in, like like I said, over a decade, they did not get any votes. So, interesting. Uh, Gerard, who would you vote for here for worst promotion? Uh, well, I'm staying on brand. I'm going with NXT 2.0. It's just bad. And I think it also is going to be disastrous long term because with the exception of Braun Breaker, who I think – has a pretty good chance of being a star. This could just end up sabotaging all of the other uh, young talent, and that's just going to be a disaster long term. Suit worst promotion for twenty twenty one. The worst promotion of the year for me is Impact Wrestling. I feel like Impact could really there's a niche they can fill a niche. I don't know how to say words. Niche is um, right. I think there you go. Niche. Um. There's a niche they can fill as like a third televised wrestling promotion. They're on Access TV, so they've got like clearance. But it's just like, they're very lazily booked. They built up Josh Alexander to win this, to get the Impact title back to Impact. And then they have Moose do a cash-in on him as soon as he wins it. It's so, it's very lazily booked. It could be, it could be more. Not a lot more, but it could be something, you know, interesting at the very least. But it's just lazy pro wrestling that you don't need to watch. And that's the, really the worst kind. Uh, Mongo, what do you have here for worst promotion? So there's definitely an interesting argument for Impact because, like, Suit said, you have Moose cashing in on Headgear Guy. And then right afterwards, they're viewership dips to like 50,000 people a week. But for me, I've got to agree with Paul that it is CMLL 
CMLL isn't just boring. Like their their shows are boring to the point where in 2019 I watched every Puebla show. I watched every almost every Friday night Arena Mexico show and was even like sick enough that sometimes I would watch the Tuesday shows and occasionally if there was a big match on Sunday that made it online I'd watch that. And now I watch zero CMLL. They got rid of the one good decision this year was giving Caristico the Mystico gimmick back, which of course came because they fired Mystico too. <laughs> then they get rid of the Dinamitas. They get rid of Microman. They've gotten rid of like half of their roster. And the only thing I could possibly care about is, is Mystico. And I can't even care that like my favorite wrestler ha- has his old gimmick back and is very happy uh, because their shows are so boring and they crash all the time. So you don't even know that you're going to be able to watch the show. You don't you don't know you'll get a refund if you can't watch it. It's it's incredible. Every layer of CMLL is bad. Uh, Sean, what do you have here for worst promotion of the year? So much like suits, I voted for impact wrestling. Um, I was thinking of a way to best describe it, but I thought suit nailed it pretty well. Just sort of lazy booking. Uh, I thought the AEW crossover stuff was the only interesting stuff they did all year. And at the same time, largely there, there's people on that roster who I like, but they also just use them in the most uninteresting ways. And then there's also what the fact at, at the same time, there's like a decent chunk of the roster who I think are like that. If like I was running a promotion, I would have no use for. And just to let you know where impact is right now. Do you realize that the main event for their pay-per-view that's coming up next week, I think is a three-way with Moose, Matt Cardona and the former big Cass for their world championship. Need I say more? <laughs> uh devin what'd you vote here for worst promotion well <clears throat> impact sounds really bad but i don't care about american wrestling so um i went with cmll because in 2019 when they switched management they managed to alienate most of their roster and m- make a business that is even more solid than wwe almost insolvent then the pandemic hit and they just went crappier and crappier. So it's like outside of like the occasional Barbaro Cavernario singles match, I don't think I watched anything from them this year. And whatever I tried was just awful. Uh, and, and I, oh, sorry, go ahead. And I don't know why anyone really cares that NXT is bad because that means WWE is going to get worse and maybe it will like poison them. So you should be encouraging them to be crappy. Uh, so I voted for NXT just because I really couldn't think of what else to vote for here. I mean, I I thought this was a not a good year anyway, so there was lots of stuff I didn't like, but there was like no one promotion that like you know really stood out to me, and it's like NXT won pretty much just for that uh, fucking uh, Io Shirai and uh, Zoe Stark segment that I talked about earlier. That's why I voted for NXT pretty much. I mean, like, plus everybody says they're horrible, so. There you go. That segment is burned into your brain, John. <laughs> you will it is really. You'll be telling people about that for decades. I guess I probably will. It's just so absurd to me. Like what? Anyway, I don't want to go through it again. Um, <laughs> but let's get to the winners here. So, uh, in third place, we have Impact with three votes. Second place, we have CMLL with four votes. And in first place, we have NXT with nine votes. So, NXT did win this one by quite a margin. Uh, even though it wasn't quite the complete runaway that you saw in prior years with WWE. So uh, they are the first winners of the WWE Memorial Award for worst promotion. So good for them. Wait a minute. Uh, Hold on. Hold on. (laughs) What? The irony of a WWE sub-brand winning the WWE Memorial Award. There's (laughs) There's something wrong here. Well, that's what happened. Uh, anyway, now we got Worst Feud, and we're we're almost done with the Worst here. We got Worst Feud and Worst Match of the Year. Uh, worst Feud, this time I'll start. I went with uh, Will Ospreay versus Kota Ibushi from New Japan. Um, so pretty much I had no idea what I was going to vote for here. And then I, you know, as I was going, creating my ballot, somebody else voted for this. And <laughs> as soon as I saw it, I was like, 
you know what? Yeah, that feud was fucking horrible. It was, um, you know, first of all, you had the f- the, the simple fact that uh, it resulted in one of the worst angles possibly in New Japan history with uh, Osprey showing how edgy he was and, how, and uh, dumping B Priestley uh, via Os Cutter to somehow show he was going to win the title, which was just an incredibly horrible angle. Uh, you had multiple horrible promos from Osprey, especially. You had the fact that it led to Ibushi losing the world title right after he, uh, you know, right after he made create this fucking title that nobody wanted uh, by merging the heavyweight and intercontinental titles. And, you know, and then he never gets his revenge or anything because Osprey obviously uh, leaves the country. And yeah, it just was, it was horrible in every single fucking way. I mean, just absolutely goddamn horrible. Uh, it, it drove people off from New Japan. You know, there, I, there were people who definitely stopped watching, you know, during that feud and when, when Osprey won the title. And yeah, I just thought it was, I thought it was a great pick for worst feud. It, it, it sticks out in my mind as a negative feud. You know, obviously there were other horrible feuds that we're going to go over, but this one really, really hurt New Japan for me. And, you know, was pretty much like you can see there's a beginning, there's a before this feud and after this feud for me. I think for a lot of people at New Japan. And I've, I really haven't been able to get back into New Japan since this feud happened. So, you know, uh, it's just a, just a really horrible feud. Devin, what do you have here for worst feud of the year? Osprey versus Ibushi. Oh, you were the one who voted for it. There you go. I just, I couldn't watch New Japan until Osprey fucked his neck afterwards, and that really hurt it for me. And I thought the B stuff was both really tasteless and almost crossed into so bad it was funny, which is not what you wanted. Like just aesthetically, it was awful. Besides just giving the bad message. And yeah, I just couldn't deal with it. I also don't like Osprey as a heavyweight main eventer. Yeah, I mean, I thought the title match was not very good either, which also... I mean, it was good. It was like, I think I gave it like three and a half or something. But I thought it was, you know, not not a great match or anything either. So it doesn't help either. Yeah, it was just the whole thing soured me aesthetically. And it led to a bunch of stupid arguments. Yeah, I couldn't deal with it. Um, actually, in the 70s, they did an angle where... Tiger Jeet Singh attacked Anoki's wife in a supermarket. I remember that. Yeah, and I think that was somehow less tasteless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not that I saw it in real time in the seventies, obviously, but I've you know, I have. Uh, I've, yeah, I've, you know, I've I've just I, I've I've seen it, you know, pictures of it and stuff. I don't know if I've seen the actual angle. Uh, it was Sean, for the magazine, so there's only pictures of it. Oh, okay. Well, there you go, Sean. Uh, what do you have here as worst feud? So I went with uh, Alexa Bliss and The Fiend Bray Wyatt versus Brandy Orton. Sort of a continuation from the end of 2020 with the uh, the very infamous angle where, you know, Randy Orton set The Fiend on fire to end a pay-per-view. Um, and yeah, it just really continued to be shit for the first third of the year. And I guess it, it was funny because it really had, they, they had the horrible match where the, the burned fiend came back and then they had the WrestleMania match with Alexa bliss, like spewing this black goo on top of the giant box, or as I believe the announcers called it, the, the box like structure. Um, and then I just thought it was so funny that it had the strangest thing where Randy Orton just won. And then the feud was dropped and then Bray Wyatt got released. So um, just, you know, all around bad feud and it didn't really help anyone. Uh, Mongo, what do you have here for worst feud? I have the same thing. Uh, Randy Orton versus the fiend with a uh, special guest appearance by uh, the pedophile bait Alexa bliss character. Just a horrible feud with horrible matches and, just like with Worst Weekly Show, it's the thing that I would see pop up in DMs the most with like little two minute video clips of Alexa trying to be creepy on her little swing set and the fiend getting burned to death and then the, the return of the burned fiend and then the box like structure and uh, and then the fiend <laughs> the is gone and um, I'm I'm just hopeful. I'm hopeful that Bray Wyatt does show up in AEW and they take John's suggestion and he becomes <laughs> the uh, associate of 
Matt Hardy as Matt Hardy's VP of money making because that would just be the funniest thing in the world to me. It would be so much better than him showing up as a fiend or anything. He just wears his big suit. He's <laughs> just Matt Hardy. he's got like these sunglasses and he's just Matt Hardy's VP of money making. Yeah. And then every just like Eddie- <laughs> every two weeks they release like a, a fiend like piece of merchandise that they don't, they never actually use in the ring. They just sell it, and because <laughs> like in kayfabe, they know that people want to see this and will buy it. So yeah, I, that's what that's how I hope uh, the Randy Orton uh, fiend uh, feud blows off with uh, the VP of money making. Suit, what do you have here as uh, the worst feud of the year? Speaking of Matt Hardy, I have Matt Hardy versus Orange Cassidy. Um, yeah, this was bad and it was long. It was just a meaningless mid-card feud that just wouldn't end. And then when it did, it ended with Matt Hardy winning. And it's like, what are we doing here? I'm done with this. Go make more kids. I don't need you here. That's Uh, to Matt Hardy, to be clear. (laughs) Did you guys actually see the video that Matt Hardy put out today from, I guess, the AW New Year's party? No. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh. he, him and Rebby were wiling out. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> they. Uh, there's gonna be more. Matt Hardy, Hardy has kids five kids. How many more does he need? He's at like a Briscoe's level at this point. And here's the funny thing: is that like in like 15 years, like there's gonna be like five or six Hardy kids running around wrestling, probably. Oh, They're good. There's gonna be more oh, Hardy oh, kids oh, than Bullet better. Club members. I'm telling you. And that's original uh, House of Torture. Um, what was the uh, Tomatonga one that didn't go anywhere? A firing squad. There you go. All them two. It's gonna be all the Hardys are gonna out. Bullet Club that. Latino America. <laughs> I had a, yes, I did. I had a I had a dream. El Terrible. Don't forget El Terrible. I don't know. Talk about all the Bullet Club offshoots. I had a dream either last night or the night before that uh, someone was like, you know, you heard the big news, right? And I was like, what? They're breaking up every New Japan unit after Wrestle Kingdom. So, you know, everybody's got to find something new to do. <laughs> like, I don't think that's going to actually happen. But it's very weird that I had a dream about it. Anyway. That was that's the cool. most boring fucking dream to have. <laughs> yeah, it was like somebody asking me, like, what do you think Naito's career is going to be like after LIJ breaks up? And Because they're breaking up every unit. So, yeah. I mean, when you record wrestling podcasts, I guess these are the boring dreams. You have people asking you wrestling questions. But anyway, um, Gerard, worst feud, what do you think? Uh, for me, this was easy because it's sabotaging uh, someone who has a lot of potential, but it's Keiji Muto versus Kaito Kiyomiya. Um, it just making Kiyomiya look like a geek. And I don't like to clown on other fans, but look, anyone who's still trying to think that this is going to turn out well, you're fooling yourselves. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen. happen. May Muda's bald head lead us all to the glory of pure love. Uh, Liam, what did you vote here for worst feud? Similar to Gerard, I also really hate the idea of people not meeting their potential um, and falling short in terms of an, uh, like an achievable goal. So I have Koto Ibushi versus the task of being a viable main eventer. <laughs> um. I think this run has been a commercial failure, a critical failure. The match has been bad. He's breaking down. And it shows really that the peak of Kodobushi has been years in the past now. And that's like, when you're trying to push a guy as a main eventer, that's really a terrible outcome. Uh, Paul, what do you hear, have here as your worst feud? My worst feud of the year is actually a fairly recent one, or one that is technically still ongoing or just finished. And that is Izanagi versus Super Crazy from All Japan. So the, the thing with this feud is, and it's actually just due to one man own, one participant in this feud, not the other one. Izanagi is fine. This is all on Super Crazy. So obviously he's a bit older now and he can't really do all the stuff he used to do, but he has become bad in a way that is very hard to describe. So the best way I can describe it is that he is awkward in a way that someone is on like their first tour of Japan when they don't really understand how everything works. And it has it is, it is gotten so much so that I actually thought I had Mandela affected the, uh, no, the like 10 year long Noah run that Super Crazy had because I just couldn't believe that this is a man that has wrestled in Japan previously. 
and it's just bad matches all around. And then they go and put the junior title on him. I think I remember talking to Gerard about this, where we were both in agreement that like there's no shot that he's going to win the title, and then he goes and wins the title. Just <laughs> really bad stuff. Suit's got his hand up. What's up, Suit? Uh, I just um, I just had some breaking news come across my Twitter feed. Uh, me and Sean are going to be uh, doing the review for WWE Day One tonight. Uh, Roman Reigns got COVID, and he's not <laughs> on the show. <laughs> Wait, is he supposed to be facing Brock Lesnar in the main event? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Guess what Brock's doing? I, I uh, he's fucking a bear. He is in the other title match now. It is going to be Big E, Kevin Owens, Seth Rollins, Bobby Lashley, and Brock Lesnar for the WWE title. So Brock can F5 all of them and then pin, stack them all on top of each other and pin them. <laughs> uh, Actually, I feel bad for ooh. Roman because he is immunocompromised. So we shouldn't. I've heard some people say apparently he's not immunocompromised. Like, I thought that I, too. I'm pretty sure he said that the drugs he takes are not immunosuppressant. Yeah. But I know he also takes extra precautions, so maybe he's just one of the few people in that company that aren't brain dead. Yeah. And he uh, he is vaccinated, too, according to Ariel Helwani, so... Well, hopefully best it's just... Best of, hopefully all it's the mild. best to... Yeah, all the best to Roman Reigns, honestly. I'm not right, being right. sarcastic. Well, Roman Reigns actually walked out of WrestleMania because they let Miz in the building with a fever. <laughs> That's, That's dope. Um, okay, sorry. So we were... I just saw Paul, right? Worst feud? He, already, he gave it already, right? Okay, yes. so let me give let me give the results here. So we had a three way tie for second with Osprey versus Kota Ibushi, Alexa Bliss versus Eva oh. Marie uh, from WWE. As my thing. starting your most recent, uh, <laughs> she really loves that name. Uh, An Inner Circle versus Men of the Year slash American Top Team from AEW. So that those three feuds all finished with uh, two votes, and the winner. So some people voted for Bray Wyatt Resort, and some people voted for Alexa Bliss. And Bray Wyatt was Randy Orton by just combining them all. So it was Alexa Bliss and the theme Bray Wyatt versus uh, versus Randy Orton. I got to remember to stop saying her fucking name. Uh, what about Lexi Kaufman? <laughs> Lexi Kaufman and the theme Bray Wyatt versus Randy Orton uh, from WWE with five five votes is your winner. Uh, and this is the Fiend's third straight year winning because he won for his feud with Seth Rollins in 2019. And first few with Braun Strowman in 2020. So I imagine that streak will finally come to an end next year. Uh, you know, I just, I can't see it. Uh, I can't see it not, not I can't see it continuing unless uh, AEW signs him and does something very stupid with him. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I guess it's possible Impact signs him and does something stupid too, but they probably won't get enough attention to win. So he's, this he's the making end. a movie this year, so he might not even be in wrestling. Yeah, so this is the end of Bray Wyatt's run. He had a good run. He he, run, he won this award three straight years, but uh, probably the end. Okay, so our final worst category here, worst match of the year. Uh, and this time we will start with you, Paul. What do you got here for worst match of the year? So my worst match of the year is actually con uh, connected to my worst feud of the year uh, because I voted for uh, Tajiri and Super Crazy versus Izanagi and Zeus from the All Japan uh Real World Tag League Finals. This is actually a rather short match. It's actually sub four minutes, but it's just the most awkward. This is just the most awkward combination of spots you will ever see. Like no one ever seemed like on the same page the entire match. And really, the only good thing I can say about it that is that it was short and it just really solidified like this whole thing being the worst feud of the year for me. Liam, what do you got for worst match of the year? So I'd like to note that for me, the worst match of the year is not necessarily the like, be, like bad quality, but is the match that is the most rote, the most boring. So I'd like to give a special shout out to Kota Ibushi versus Kenta from G1 Night 17 for being a fucking rubbish, nonsensical, you know, convoluted, incoherent match. But the worst match of the year is Kota Ibushi versus Tomohiro Ishii from Night 3 of the G1 Climax. Uh, okay, why'd you, why'd you hate it? Because it was a boring, rote, lifeless performance from two people who should be doing a lot better. Kota Ibushi had no business being in the ring, recovering from that uh, pneumonia strain he had. Ishii peaked like six years ago and is like rapidly slowing down, even if people you know, try to cover that up. Um, it was a 15-minute match that felt like a 35-minute match in a G1. 
Well, there you go. Gerard, what do you got here for worst match of the year? Uh, my worst match of the year comes from WWE Fastlane Vroom Vroom. It was uh, Alexa Bliss versus Randy Orton, where uh, Alexa won via cowgirl. <laughs> she won for what? I didn't even see the match. I oh, no. Well, game. she ends up pinning Randy Orton by straddling him. <laughs> okay. While dressed uh, like a child. While dressed like a child. <laughs> and there's clear. also objects was, falling from the ceiling, I believe, at that match, too. The Terry Garvin Memorial match. And there was also the fact that that suggestive pin led to Randy Orton's wife getting legitimately pissed at at uh, Alexa on Twitter. So that was fun. Uh, Sue, what do you have here for worst match of the year? Oh, man. Imagine watching a 40-minute match just to see Seth Rollins get put over at the end. The men's Survivor Series elimination match. Meaningless. 40 minutes of just meaningless pro wrestling. Mongo, worst match of the year. Mongo? Are you there, Mongo? I am here. I thought I had already (laughs) unmuted. Um, I was just pulling up a highlight of the match to just bring it to mind just how great it was uh my worst match of the year is the charlotte nia Jax match from raw with the infamous uh shoot where they either pretended to not cooperate or they didn't cooperate and it involves nia Jax shooting for like the worst take takedown you've ever seen and like half speed rope running and this terrible attempt at a Samoan drop, these hilarious slap exchanges. It's just an incredibly bad match. Um, and was the Jordan Oliver, Tony Deppen match much more boring? Was it worse than this? Probably. But for some reason that made that the worst show of the year, but this was still a worst match of the year. Uh, Sean worst match of the year for 2021. So, much like Gerard, I went with the Alexa Bliss Randy Orton match from Fast Lane back in March. Uh, just to, not going to say much, just going, you know, repeating what he said. The magic tricks, the Alexa Bliss nonsense, you know, uh, the, the burned fiend coming back, and the suggestive pin that got Randy Orton's wife legitimately mad at everything. So that was all. Th- that last bit was funny, but the match was very bad. Uh, and Devin, worst match of the year. Evil versus Jano lights out. It was really horrible. <laughs> it was, it really was just so bad. The stipulation made no sense. And Evil was still made of enter afterwards, which is the most egregious thing. Uh, so I voted for the Inner Circle versus Men of the Year and American Top Team from AEW Full Gear. Uh, November 13th in Minneapolis. I mean, there were matches that were horrible this year. There were, I mean, Evil Virgiano was my pick until, I, until you know, I watched this match. But there were a few times I had less fun watching professional wrestling than watching this endless fucking garbage brawl uh, with a bunch of wrestler, people who are not trained to wrestle, blowing spots constantly, and, you know, waiting for this fucking thing to be over. After we already had a long garbage brawl earlier in the same show, uh, it just felt complete overkill. They AEW needs to learn how to pace their pay per views better. I don't know what else to say. I mean, they finally had a really great one with All Out, obviously, but other than that, they they really paced these pay per views horribly. And you know, I thought Full Gear was the most egregious one, and this match was uh, the most egregious match I saw in 2021. Just really hated it. So we had a three three way tie for the winner here: uh, Miss Bliss versus Randy Orton. WWE, uh, 321, that got two votes. Toriana versus Evil, that got two votes. And Inner Circle versus Men of the Year American Top Team, that got two votes. So all three matches here won. Uh, nothing could break out of the pack here. Uh, 20 matches in total got at least a single vote. So people were voting for all sorts of shit that they hated, but nothing uh, broke out of the pack here. So we ended up with that, uh, you know, worst, worst, worst match of the year, a three-way tie. So, John Best Weekly out. TV Show, our last Category B award, and we're finally in the best. So if you're tired of hearing us say what sucked in 2021, from here on out, it's only good stuff. Uh, so my vote here, I voted for AEW Dynamite. Uh, you know, as much as I don't love AEW as much as some people, um, you know, I did think the entire second half of the year, I thought they did a pretty damn good job. Uh, you know, I don't watch this show every week, 
but when I do watch it, I usually enjoy it. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, if, again, especially after the second half of the year, I think up to, they had a really good run leading into revolution. And then I thought, you know, revolution, you know, as we went into kind of sucked and it f- fell off after that for a while, especially those, uh, when they got moved, when they were moved out of their time slot, there was like Saturday night dynamite or Friday night, whatever the hell it was. Those shows were not very good either. But after they got back to the regular time slot and, you know, Punk comes in and Danielson comes in, they really took off in the second half of the year. And I thought had a very strong second half. Uh, and this was, a you know, a, clearly the best television show, I think. Uh, definitely one that I enjoy watching most weeks at this point. So AEW Dynamite, definitely my pick for best weekly TV. Uh, what'd you pick here for best weekly TV, Devin? I like Dynamite a lot, but I didn't like the beginning of the year. But I liked Rampage a little bit more. Overall, so I picked around page. So those are the only two weekly shows I watched on a regular basis. So, uh, Sean, what'd you pick here for best weekly TV? So I went pretty chalk, and I went with uh, AW Dynamite. Um, yeah, I, I, that period during the summer, or I guess in the early summer where they were off uh, Wednesday for a month, was certainly you know not the best quality of television but i think for the for the most part they were the, the television show was pretty good especially once they were able to go touring on the road again and had fans back in the buildings so uh yeah i went with uh dynamite mongo so Mongo, i went with uh dynamite it's easily my favorite wrestling show in many years uh, it's the only show where i I'm considering driving like five hours to Newark this week just to see this Hangman Danielson match, but I don't think I'm going to do that. It seems like a bad <laughs> idea with uh, not just a like eight or nine hour round trip, depending on what traffic is like uh, on the Connecticut Turnpike, but with Omicron going around, maybe, maybe not the best idea, but it's a good enough show that I'm like, I kind of want to go, but uh, I, I love the, uh, the midsummer run where hangman was fighting to get that title shot and ultimately failing in that awesome uh, elimination match. I've really liked, um, really liked the show most weeks and some weeks it's just a good enough show where I'm pacing around watching my television, enjoying, uh, enjoying some TV. All right. We had some technical difficulties there, but we're all back on, on the call here. So suit we're up to you here for best weekly TV. They call me One Take Williams. Uh, my uh, best TV show, Dynamite. Uh, I had 85 notebook matches this year. 31 of them were on Dynamite. It's just a very good show uh, with some very good wrestling sometimes. And also good angles. Gerard, best weekly TV. Uh, yeah, I went with Dynamite too. I mean, I don't really have much else to add except for uh, I enjoy it most weeks and I took me a while to get into it because, you know, like you, John, like American, North American wrestling isn't my ideal style, but they've managed to pull me in. Uh, Liam, best weekly TV. So I don't really watch much um, American TV. Um, so I voted for DDT Maji Manji, despite <laughs> it not being broadcast since 2018. There you go. Uh, and finally, Paul, your pick for best weekly TV. My pick for West Weekly TV is AEW Rampage. Uh, I think it's it's a nice and clean one hour, which is always welcome. And I think just in its short existence, there have been so many great matches on that show that it is the best weekly TV show. So the top three here, probably not a big surprise. Third place, AEW Rampage with two points. Second place, New Japan Strong with three points. And first place, AEW Dynamite with 19 votes. I shouldn't say points, I should say votes. So uh, 19 votes for Dynamite, three for Strong, two for Rampage. Nothing else got a vote unless you want to count uh, Liam voting for Majin Banji in a year where it's not eligible. So let's get to the Category A awards now. So everybody here is picking their top three now. And again, these are a 5-3-2 point system. So five points for first place, three for second place, and two for third place. Uh, the tiebreaker here, if we're tied with points, is most first place votes which it does come into play a few times. Uh, so we'll start out here. Again, everybody's going to give their top three in reverse order. Uh, so this time we'll start with Paul. What did you vote for this year for best major show? So for best major show, 
Uh, in third place, I had GWF Legacy 25. It's a show that I actually attended live and had front row tickets for. So I would assume that that probably played a role in the vote as well. Just a very good uh, good show, top to bottom. And it had an excellent main event in Axel Tischer versus Bad Bones. And I was really surprised. I, I wasn't quite sure like what to expect uh, in a match between these two, but they just tore the house down and just really good stuff overall. Then in second place, I voted for another show that I attended live, and that was AEW All Out. Uh, it that it was just a really great show, top to bottom. It was uh, you had all of the debuts on the shows as well, and I'm sure other people will be talking about the show as well. So just a well deserved vote there. Uh, and then my uh, best show of the year was New Japan's Wrestle Kingdom Night Two. Uh, again. We're talking about match quality. Uh, there wasn't really anything else this year that kind of beat Night 2 of Wrestle Kingdom when it came to just pure match quality. And it's actually my match of the year happened on this show. So I will be talking about that one later as well. Uh, Liam, best major show, what'd you vote for? So for the third place, I voted for the Champion Carnival Final from the uh, 3rd of May. I thought that was a very strong ending to that tournament with two really strong matches right on top. And flowed, even despite it being empty arena, it was a really strong, um, you know, flowed really well. Uh, for second place, I voted for the Cyberfight Festival on the 6th of June. Uh, a really diverse, really, you know, well-structured show that brought in t- um, talents from Tokyo Joshi, DBT, and Noah into, like, a really strong top to bottom show. And then for first place, I voted for Noah back to Budokan. Um, you know, the arc goes back to the Budokan for the first time in 11 years, and in terms of just show flow and cohesive show as a whole, um, I thought that was a really incredible... Like, it was a very, very easy watch. I think it's like four and a half hours and it flew by. So, for me, that was the best show of the year. Liam, what did you vote here for best major show? I just went. Oh, I'm sorry. Gerard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to do that at least once, I'm sure. Probably multiple times. Okay, for number three, I had uh, Gaiaism, Decade of Quarter Century, on June 13th, 2021. Uh, it was supposed to be the 25th anniversary show uh, founding of Gaia in uh, 1995. It was supposed to happen in 2020, so it got pushed back. It was a really fun, great tribute show to like a era of Joshi that no longer exists. So it sort of brought me back uh, to thinking about you know, a very different time in Joshi and it had an incredible main event. Number two, I went with AEW, AEW All Out. Um, I think much has already been said about that show, but it was great and had uh, an incredible angle at the end. And my number one show was the Cyber Fight Festival from uh, June 6th. I just thought it was a great combination of all of the promotions coming together. It had some great matches uh, like Akiyama versus Hiroshima, and I really liked that uh, like Team DDT versus uh, Congo match was a lot of fun. Uh, one of my favorite moments of the year was Keno on a bicycle. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, suit, your best major show picks. All right, at number three, I have NXT TakeOver Vengeance Day from February 14th. Uh, this was really the dead cat bounce for NXT because... Everything after this was a train wreck. Uh, it's the last takeover of the... It's the last real great takeover of the Black and Gold era. I had three notebook matches on it. Uh, Pete Dunne versus Finn Balor in the main event was threatening my match of the year list. A great show. And the you know, end of an era, really. Uh, number two, I had Wrestle Kingdom Day... Which day? Where are my notes? Wrestle Kingdom Day 2, January 5th. Uh, I had two Match of the Year candidates on it, and the Evil Singles match wasn't as bad as I was expecting. I call that a win. It was awesome. Yeah. (laughs) And then then number one, AEW Double or Nothing, May 30th. Uh, I had five notebook matches on this show. It was my first live wrestling show in years, which probably helped. It had the best live match I had ever seen at the time. Young Bucks versus Moxley and Kingston. And then uh, the main event was really fun in-house because we were all just popping for the spots as if they were happening in front of us. It's a shame you you guys at home couldn't hear that. But, hey, I was there. So it was fun. Uh, Just a really great show. 
Mongo, uh, best major show. So I'll give a quick honorable mention for GCW's Tournament of Survival, which was the first live show I'd been able to go to after the pandemic. And walking in like a minute into the G Raver uh, Effie match was incredible. And but my number three is Double or Nothing. I unfortunately could not watch this show live on pay-per-view because I had a previous engagement and I'm just watching people like DMing me about how good this is and watching my feed. And I'm like, Oh God, I, I should have skipped this. Should have skipped this to go to, to watch the show. I was even thinking like, maybe I should fly to this show, but I wasn't as cool as suit. Um, just a fantastic show. Deeb uh, versus Riho was an incredible opener. Then you had the Bucks uh, Moxley Kingston match, which was great. Pretty much everything on this show was great. I mean, I, I wouldn't go more than good on uh, the Britt Baker versus uh, Sheeta match, but still, it was still a pretty good match. And then that stadium stampede match was just incredibly fun from the, the inner circle entrance rappelling down the scoreboard to the in arena finish with uh, Sammy Guevara hitting the 630. It was just a tremendous show. Uh, number two, I have the Stardom Anniversary show from uh, Budokan. Another just like, uh, this one probably wasn't as top to bottom great as uh, Double or Nothing because there was like, like a couple things on there that you know weren't amazing. But, you know, the high-speed title match was really fun. Um, Momo Watanabe versus... Um, uh, the, the uh, versus Takahashi match was really good. Uh, the SWA match was really good. Uh, Mayu Itani versus Yoshiko match was really good. And then you had that main event of T- Tam Nakano finally winning uh, the Wonder of Stardom title, winning the hair versus hair match. It was like something that right before the pandemic, I'm like, oh, they keep they keep like going only so far with Tam, and I really want her to like finally get her big win, like. And she gets it here in a hair versus hair match. And it was fantastic. Really great moment. Um, and then my number one is AEW All Out. Um, there's not much more that can be said about this show. That cage match is incredible. All of the debuts were incredible. Um, just everything on that show was, uh, it was just a, an amazing way to spend four plus hours. It was that that kind of four plus hour show. I, I don't mind AEW's pay per view pacing. Like I I like longer shows. Like I I liked watching New Japan four hour shows in the middle of the night. But like this one, just especially like it just kept going and going, and it was great. All right, we died again, everybody. So Sean's turn to do best major show. Sean, what do you got? Okay, so for third place, I voted the New Beginning in Nagoya show from New Japan that took place on January thirtieth. Uh, this was headlined by the Never Title match, where Tanahashi won the title from Shingo in what I thought was one of the best matches of the year. Uh, the semi-main event was maybe not one of the best matches of the year, but one of my personal favorite matches of the year with the uh, the no DQ match with Will Ospreay and Satoshi Kojima. And then below that was the, the, the end of the fun feud that we had between Tenzon and the Great Okan for the, the battle for the Mongolian Chop. Uh, even though that stipulation did not last very long and Tenzon broke it a couple weeks later. Uh, it was still a fun feud in the moment. And the rest of the show only had a couple multi-man tags, but I thought the top three matches on the card were pretty strong, all things considered. Uh, my number two show of the year was actually night one of Wrestle Kingdom on January 4th, uh, headlined by, uh, let me see, it was Osprey and Okada, and then Naito and Ibushi, which I thought were two of the best matches of the year. Um, and really what puts this show for me, at least above the second night of Wrestle Kingdom, was just the fact that uh, the main card did not have the King of Pro Wrestling match. <laughs> so there was really nothing else on the undercard that I thought was... The undercard of the main show, I should say, that I thought was bad. Um, and then my number one show was uh, All Out, which was a fantastic wrestling show from top to bottom and had one of the greatest closing angles to pay-per-view I think there's ever been, at least uh, at least in American wrestling. Uh, all righty. Devin? So yeah, my number three was DDT Peter Pan, the one in the baseball stadium, Kawasaki. And... Just thought it was a great show. I forgot Cyberfight existed. So there was that. 
My number two was the um, All Out Paper for AEW. Again, it was probably my favorite American wrestling show in over a decade. So I really like that. And number one was Wrestle Kingdom Night 2. It had my favorite match of the year in Abushi versus Jay White. And it also had, I believe, Cobb versus Shingo, which I loved. I thought it was a really exciting start to a year in New Japan that wound up being very disappointing in some ways. All right, folks. So we're back here. We had to switch recording methods. So if it sounds different now uh, and it doesn't sound as good, I apologize. But uh, just Zencaster was not working for us with the this many people. So we're trying something different. Hopefully it works just to try to power through the rest of this episode now. So I was giving my best major show picks when I got cut off. So I will start that over again. I'm already uh, dreading what a nightmare this show is going to be to edit. Uh, third place, I have AEW All Out. Uh, September 5th in Chicago. Um, you know, I thought Full Gear was the better show when it came to in-ring wrestling. I thought there was better peaks on that show. But All Out, as I said earlier, was like the first AEW pay-per-view maybe ever that was paced well and didn't feel like a chore to sit through at certain points like Full Gear did. Uh, you know, everything on the show was good. Everything on the show, uh, you know, felt like it just felt like a big show and obviously had a really classic show closing angle. So, you know, I thought All Out was just an amazing show. One of the best American pay-per-views ever. And even though I feel like the wrestling was a little overrated, uh, you know, like the match quality was better on full gear, uh, you know, at least the peaks. Uh, I still thought All Out was the overall better show. Uh, second place, I have Wrestle Kingdom 15 Night 2. Uh, even though, again, my peak match from either night was on Night 1, I thought Night 2 had, you know, more, uh, more high-quality matches overall, especially the combo of uh you know shingo and uh jeff cobb i believe hiromu and uh uh hiromu, taiji ishimori right that would have been on that show too and you know the the main event obviously with uh ibushi and jay white all really awesome matches and all on night two um as far as you know it just it didn't quite go to number one mostly because of the you know, King of Pro Wrestling match that somebody else mentioned. And my number one show, I mean, the most fun I had watching the show this year was the DDT, Noah, and Tokyo Joshi Cyber Fight Festival from June 6th in Tokyo. Others have already covered it, so I won't go into too much detail, but uh, I did think it was a great, an awesome show. And I love that uh, the Miyu Yamashita, uh, you know, Tok- Tokyo Joshi title match on there. Uh, um, but yes, so that is what I voted for, number one, the... Uh, the cyber fight festival. Okay. So the best major show picks overall, actually the same top three I just gave, except in a different order. So the voters went with cyber fight festival in third. It had 25 points and four first place votes. Wrestle kingdom 15 night two and second 31 points and three first place votes. And the overwhelming winner was a uh, AW AW and interrupted new Japan's dominance in this category as Russell Kingdom in particular had won this uh, won this award all four previous years, 2017 through 2020, uh, night two of 2020 in, in particular. But this year it goes to AW All Out, September 5th in Chicago, 79 points and 12 first place votes. Okay, so we go to best promotion. Uh, and this time it's me kicking things off here. I put New Japan in third. I really couldn't put them any higher here. I mean... You know, I, I they still had a lot of matches I really loved. I still think the, you know, as far as like matches that dominated my four star plus spreadsheet, they were still there with the quantity of, you know, really high level matches. But, you know, as far as like which promotion, um, you know, uh, like like overall best promotion, I can't just go based on match quality. I thought their 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 angles were horrible this year. The storylines went nowhere all the shit with Eve and all that, uh, you know, all the shit with Osprey that I hated. It just was a lousy year in a lot of different ways. So even though they had, you know, ama- some amazing matches still, as they do seemingly every year, uh, I could not vote them any higher than third. I just, you know, it, it just, it really grated on me this year. And I, it, it reached a point where I couldn't watch it anymore. Uh, you know, I'm going to try to get back into it, obviously, Wrestle Kingdom, but it just really was not a good year overall, but they still went through, still put them third place because of the number of high level matches they had. I put AEW second again. Um, 
given everything that's gone on with Tony Khan his Twitter, I don't, you know, it just feels weird to be putting over AW right now. I mean, uh, you know, really weird timing for that. But, uh, you know, they had an amazing second half of the year that even, so even though, you know, American wrestling will never be my favorite thing, uh, I have to put them at least second here. And I put Tokyo Joshi first. Why? They were the only promotion that, you know, every time I watch them, I really enjoy them. Um, you know, even though I don't watch them enough, uh, I don't watch every show, but every time I watched them, I had a lot of fun. They never pissed me off. They never annoyed me. Uh, just, uh, they're just the most fun promotion that I follow. And, you know, the wrestling can be pretty underrated, but even when the matches aren't great, they still, you know, uh, make me enjoy, you know, I have a great time watching them. So that's why I voted for Tokyo Joshi uh, first here. So Devin, what'd you put here for best promotion? Uh, going in descending order, number three, I went with Stardom, just because the quality's been really good and I've enjoyed all the storylines and the big shows really hit. Number two, I went with New Japan just because of how much they dominated my match of the year list. I have a notebook for the first time this year. I had 300 something mat, 374 matches across 18 promotions, and New Japan had the most by far. And number one, I went with Pro Wrestling Noah just because I kind of had the most fun watching it and following it like a kind of like the 2016, 2017, 2018 New Japan. Uh, Also, I love the old fuck stuff. (laughs) Uh, Sean, what do you got here for best promotion? So for my number three spots, I went with GCW. Uh, I'm the ROH guy. Normally, this is the spot where I would would have thrown ROH in here, but I really can't in good conscience vote for a promotion that likely went out of business this year. So uh, I went with GCW. Just, you know, they I didn't watch every show, and even the shows I did, I did watch, I didn't watch all the matches, but... Uh, there, they did have some good matches on that I liked, some hyped matches that they had that I liked, and largely, I think coming out of the pandemic, at least you know, it's, COVID's still very much a thing. But over the course of last year, uh, GCW's profile was raised, you know, very much so, and they're at the point now where they're running the Hammerstein Hammerstein Ballroom in a couple of weeks. Uh, number two, I went with uh, New Japan uh, again. Like Devin said, this is you know mainly based on the fact that I have a lot of highly rated matches from them for 2021. And there's, you know, the obvious issues that they've had, but um, I, 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 for this category, I can only, you know, in good conscience vote for promotions I watched and out of what I watched, they're more than likely the number two. And then the number one is AEW and, particularly their second half of the year was very strong and uh, they have great television for the most part. The pay-per-views are pretty solid for the most part. Um, and yeah, I think they're very, they were a very easy number one for me this year. Mongo. My number three is GCW who ended 2020 and started 2021 with a really bad stale run of shows really going until maybe spring break. But um, once once Tournament of Survival came around, that was an incredible show to go to live. The backyard wrestling show is always fantastic, and they've you know obviously been doing really well business wise um, with the title on Moxley. So you know, I hope I can get some uh, secondary market tickets to the Hammerstein show because I didn't expect it to sell, sell out as fast as it did. Uh, number two, Stardom. I mean, Stardom is good enough that I was kind of cursing John. Uh, in, in jest, but for having the deadline for the show be so early because I really wanted to see that pay-per-view because I wasn't, there might've been something that squeaked out to my match of the year uh, ballot, but it ended up not, even though I, I did really like that, uh, that title match on that show. But uh, overall, I think stardom had a great year. I, I loved the anniversary show. I love, I loved a lot of uh, what they did this year. It was the the one Japanese promotion that really, to me, felt super like hot. Felt like it was. I was excited to watch shows. And number one is AEW. This was the best year for an American company that I've seen since like 2007 ROH, when you had uh, you know Morishima just killing everyone, and then Nigel finally winning the title, and a lot of other really in the Briscoes, um, the Briscoes Steen Generico feud. Um, this year was just 
a fantastic year for televised wrestling and in, in AEW and uh even the the YouTube shows I really like. I still love the uh the laid back nature of dark. So great, great year for AEW and uh better year than 2020 overall. Uh the promotions I liked were better except for CMLL, which was worse, and New Japan, which was worse. A and triple A is just kind of what triple A is. Uh, suit, what do you got here for best promotion? Oh, uh, suit, you're really cracking up. This is why I hate using <laughs> Jitsi. Suit. Uh... <laughs> suit. Okay, we may have lost suit. Uh, I'll try to get back to him if he's able to reconnect. Uh, it looks like he's muted. Yeah, but he like he what he he had like the red bars, which happens with Jitsi. Anyway, uh so I'll try to go back to you if you can still hear me. Gerard, what do you got for best promotion? Uh so number three, I have AEW, really strong second half of the year. Uh number two, stardom. Um, I think others have said how great it's been all year and with some incredible feuds, and also like just like by pure business metrics, they're like the only Japanese company that can say for sure they have definitely grown and they, they had their best year ever. Yeah, exactly. And number one, uh, I went with pro wrestling Noah, uh, despite some dubious booking in the juniors and of Kaido Kiyomiya at the end of the day, it's still what I want from professional wrestling. Uh, Sue, you're back now. Uh, hopefully we can hear you. What are your picks for best promotion? Okay, did you get my number three or did you not hear no, me at we all? We didn't really hear you at all, so go ahead. Okay, number three, New Japan. They've got problems. Some of it their fault, some of it not. But they have a talented roster. Comes through a lot. Uh, number two, I've got Dragon Gate. They elevated a lot of young stars this year. Uh, Shun Skywalker had the Dream Gate for the first part of the year. Uh, SB Kento is going to run the company one day. Kota Minora had his first uh, Dreamgate shot. He looks like a really good uh, prospect for the future. And then you've got your new Open the Dreamgate champion, Kai. So, uh, yeah, young stars. There you go. And then uh, number one, AEW. AEW never die. Uh, Liam, what do you got here for both promotions? So for third, I voted for New Japan. Uh, there's some you know, great peaks in New Japan this year. They've become worryingly inconsistent. Uh, I skipped of shows in Best of Super Juniors for the first time in like five years. Um, so yeah, third place for uh, New Japan. For second, I voted for DDT. I think DDT has been pretty consistent this year. They haven't been great, but they, in terms of like the Korokun to Korokun and the big show sort of arc, I feel like they've hit like a really good groove and they're actually recovering from sort of the pandemic shutdown, you know, shenanigans pretty well. Um, but my number one is Pro Wrestling Noah. And I'd like to point out, you know, one of the things that really puts this, um, puts them over the top of me, uh, puts them over the top of me, is they've really improved their production this year. Their shows look incredible. Um, they've in- they've introduced a English commentary team that makes the product much more accessible. Cyberreach has put a lot of money into Noah to improve their reach, improve their production, improve the quality of the product, and it's showing in the results. It's showing in how the product comes out on the screen. So Noah wins this by a fairly wide margin. Uh, and Paul, what do you got here for best promotion? So at number three, I have Dragon Gate. And Dragon Gate most likely would have actually been my number one if the Yamato Rain hadn't just kind of like driven me out of the promotion a bit. But I think Suit has kind of already gone over like all of the great things they've done this year. Uh, my number two is Tokyo Joshi. Uh, yeah, John, as you've said, uh, just very very good year for the promotion all around like nothing really bad either uh i will say maybe it's one of the negatives is that while wrestle princess 2 was still a good show it wasn't nearly as good as last year's wrestle princess and i think yeah. that's kind of what held it back from being my number one and my number one was aew just an amazing second half of the year with fallout and all of the amazing stuff they've done on tv since then so and a really solid first half of the year so in combination in 2021 that easily makes it the best promotion so the results here very close between third and second noah finishes third with 35 points five first place votes new japan finishes second 36 points two first place votes and aw wins in a landslide really no surprise 
uh, 96 points, 16 first place votes. So they win this award for the second straight year. Okay, so now we got best feud. Uh, what you can start out this time, Paul? What you got here for best feud? Yeah. So in third third place, I have SB Kento versus Jackie Funky Kamei. We've already kind of touched on how Dragon Gate has done a lot of stuff to really elevate guys, and this was an example of that. These guys are really only in their second full years as wrestlers, and they already had one of the best feuds of the year and some of the best matches of the year as well. And this is really something that will kind of carry the promotion for years going forward. Like it's it's already kind of baffling as good as they are already is that they are very likely going to get even better and their matches are going to get better as well. That's scary. Uh, second place, I have Kenji Miyahara versus Jake Lee. It's I've, it that was really kind of the cornerstone feud for all Japan this year, and I think these two have had some really good matches and are really the guys that are carrying the promotion. And then as best feud of the year, I have Brian Dennison versus Hangman Adam Page. Just really part as we talked about, like really kind of key to kind of that amazing second half of the year. Uh, for uh, AEW has been especially Brian Danielson and I think he really went onto another level as well when he started feuding with Hangman Adam Page and it's not even a feud that is over yet so we'll see if it can actually build on what has already been established uh, Liam, best feud So for third I have DDT versus Congo um, I thought this was like a really heated you know, six to eight week feud that built off his work from 2020 um, I think the payoff for in the summer fight fest was, um, you know, really well done. And Kano rode a bicycle. For second place, I have Katsuhiko Nakajima versus Masa Kitamiya. Um, they went from, you know, brooding faction mates to, um, you know, a tag team that immediately achieved success, building back on the previous aggression run to then turning on each other, well, Masa turning on Katsu, and then having that amazing cage match that ended their um, sort of rivalry and led to a rebirth in sort of both of their characters in respect. Um, no, not being able to capitalize on Masa Kitamiya after that feud is like a massive disappointment, but I feel like that feud as a whole really helped boost Nakajima up to the level he's at at the moment. And then number one is El Desperado versus Hiromu Takahashi. These two have been feuding for nearly 10 years at this point. Um, and I feel like the work they've done this year to really build a feud to the apex, which is going to happen in a couple of days, um, it's been understated, but I feel like in terms of the, you know, the tag quality, the tag chemistry, the singles match they had in the best of Super Juniors, um, the promos, the interviews, um, I feel like they're really building this long-term story up to a massive conclusion this year, and I really hope they pay it off well in a couple of days. Uh, Gerard, what do you got here for best feud? Uh, so for number three, I have Hangman Adam Page versus, uh, Brian Danielson. I'm not as high on Hangman as some others are. I like him, but he just doesn't emotionally connect with me like he does with others. But I thought uh, Danielson, I keep making, almost saying Daniel Bryan, uh, so I have to watch out for that. But um, uh, Danielson was just tremendous here and just slid into the heel role just perfectly, and it was incredible. Number two, uh, CM Punk versus Eddie Kingston. Uh, Just some of the best mic work I've heard in a long, long time. I, I can't even remember the last time I heard like cutting promos on each other. That was that good. And my number one feud of the year that I sent in before their final match happened, but I feel justified in still putting it there is Utami Hayashishida versus uh, Shuri. Just an incredible feud that made the company this year. Suit best feud. Oh God, I may lose suit again. <laughs> uh, Okay, we, lo- we might have lost suit again, so I will say Mongo, best feud. Okay, so my best feud, number three, was the Young Bucks versus the Lucha Bros slash Death Triangle, depending on how you want to uh, categorize this. Um, early in the year, we had some incredible matches where various members of the Lucha Brothers would team with Pac, Pac, I'm sorry, Pac, versus uh, the Bucks for the titles, and then eventually just climaxing in that cage match, which was one of the best blow-off matches you could hope for. Uh, Number two, uh, I know a lot of people hated this feud uh, on this call, but it is American Top Team versus the Inner Circle. I loved this feud. I love 
like heavy heat feuds and this feud had so much heat the match at um arthur ash was really really fun for that reason and i personally loved the minneapolis street fight i thought it was really funny and i just, I just a, want to back you up not to interrupt but dan lambert is so much fun i i can't believe how great like dan lambert is it's just like a, a vessel for heat it's, when he when he insults the audience it's not that fun but like when he goes after cody or Jer- or jericho he's just like because he can say the things the contracted wrestlers can't say about their bosses and it's so much fun <laughs> the, there was a dan lambert moment at the end of the um Ethan Page match from Rampage last night where I didn't see it. R- right after Ethan gets pinned, they just cut to Dan Lambert and he has this just sad look on his face that it was it was really funny for like a guy who's just kind of there to cut these wacky insane promos that he just had a little bit of like dynamic range on his character. It was it was good. I liked and, on Wednesday when he called Cody's neck tattoo a transformer and then everyone started cheering <laughs> for him. That was, that was great. I, I, I love him. And then speaking of people I love, number one, Tam knocking over versus Julia. Um, that hair versus hair match was the perfect way to end this. It, you know, it got to headline the big show. So that is my number one for the year. All right. So we'll go back to suit again. Suit, can you hear me now? Oh, God. <laughs> suit? <laughs> uh, you sound like a robot, Suit. Are you there? Hold on. I can hear you. Is my audio better? No. <laughs> Christ. Uh, okay. Um, we'll try suit again, I guess, after. Sean, uh, best feud. Okay. So Wait, hold on. Ca- She's back. Suit? Suit? Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Go best feud before you die again. Hangman Omega, Jericho MJF, number one punk Kingston. I don't trust my connection enough to elaborate. <laughs> Go. Who's next? Go. Sean, best for you. Okay, so this category was, I think, the hardest one to suss out. So I just went with, you know, what I felt were the best choices in the moment. Uh, third, I went with Matt Cardona versus GCW just as a whole. Um, I don't know. From what I saw, I, I just thought that Matt Cardona did a very good job in his role in that whole sort of thing where he was feuding with basically the entire promotion. Uh, number two, uh, Okada versus Jeff Cobb from New Japan. This is just based on their series of matches this year, which I thought were all excellent. And then number one, I had CM Punk versus Eddie Kingston from AEW. Uh, it was a very short feud, but for a uh, one big promo and one big match combo, it was pretty excellent. Uh, Devin, best feud. Am I muted or not? I can't tell. No, you're not muted. Okay. Uh, number th- three, I wish I went higher, was Siri versus Utami Hayashida. I thought it was, they had my favorite mat- second favorite match of the year, and I just loved it. I thought they did great work, and they just elevated the whole company. Number two is a weird one. I went with Desperado versus Phantasma, because I feel like Phantasma stepped up, and it kind of helped make Desperado into a star by having this sort of like, it's good when he goes against Hiromu, but it's babyface versus babyface. So I liked him having, like, a prick heel to work off of and sort of make him into a babyface star. And number one, I thought I was on drugs when I was looking over my ballot, but a lot of people agreed with me. I went Kingston versus Punk just because it was short, but fuck, I en- there's nothing I enjoyed as much overall. So for my ballot, I went with Kenny Omega versus Hangman Adam Page in third. Uh, I just really like the build to Paige finally winning the title. Uh, we already talked about it earlier, but that like everything leading up to that elimination match where they, uh, you know, kind of swerved the other way, I thought was a really effective swerve for once. Uh, and I thought, you know, again, the build up here was really, really good to, you know, did feel satisfying when he finally won it. Uh, second place, I went with LIJ versus Dangerous Techers, which was probably the most I enjoyed, you know, any feud this year, like a traditional feud. Um, you know, I thought both both teams did, did some really fun promos. It just had this really, you know, fun sense to it. And I, I loved all their matches, which I know some people, you know, didn't, but I loved all those tag title matches. Uh, and in first place, I went with Tetsuya Naito versus Kota Ibushi. 
just felt like I had to, considering I have two of my top three matches, as we'll get into in a second. Uh, you know, I didn't necessarily love the promo work here. I mean, I thought Naito did some very effective promos. Kota's, Kota's promos about merging the belts was, were all kind of stupid and didn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, but I did think overall, you know, just, just having two matches uh, that I both gave four and three quarters, it has to win best feud at that point. So that is why I went with first place here. Okay, so the results here for the category. Uh, in third place was Heyman, Adam Page against Brian Danielson. Uh, that got 14 points, two first place votes. It was an AW sweeper, the top three. So Page against Danielson in third, Page against Omega in second, uh, 29 points, five first place votes. And then CM Punk versus Eddie Kingston in first, 43 points, six first place votes. All right, so we're going to swerve around, speaking of swerving, to most outstanding wrestler, just to split that up from wrestler of the year, also to split up match of the year and best feud. Uh, so let me get into my picks here. So again, for people who don't know the difference, most outstanding is best wrestler of the year, strictly from an in-ring perspective, nothing else considered, uh, versus, you know, wrestler of the year, which is more like, you know, MVP quality slash, if you want to look at effects on the promotion's popularity or business, if you can even tell at this point. So one my, is the ace and one is just the best worker. Yeah, exactly. So my picks here for most outstanding, uh, in third place, I went with Brian Danielson. I thought he's do, done amazing work since coming back to AEW. Uh, you know, I'm sure lots of other people are going to vote for him here, so I don't have to get, go into a ton of detail. Uh, second place, I went with Tetsuya Naito. He has two of my top three matches in match of the year. I thought all the stuff with Sonata was amazing. Uh, the tag title stuff with Sonata against the Dangerous Deckers was amazing. Uh, you know, I thought I really loved the Great Okan feud, too. If he only could have had a great G1 run uh, without getting injured, I could have voted for him first, but uh, obviously it didn't happen. I still thought he had an outstanding, a, a very under the radar outstanding year. But first place, really not any consideration of anyone else here. Had to be Shingo Takagi. Uh, I don't even want to think about how dire New Japan would have been without Shingo's, uh, you know, major matches here. Uh, just an outstanding G1, you know, the world title matches. And I wasn't even as high on the, on the Shingo Osprey match or matches, I should say, as some people. But you know, I just think he had a really, really, you know, outstanding year overall. The Okada match at New Japan Cup, another one that didn't make, quite make my match of the year list that I loved. Uh, obviously, the, the two Tanahashi matches, especially the New Beginning one, and the Jeff Cobb match at Wrestle Kingdom. I mean, this guy, he clearly was the most outstanding wrestler of 2021 for me. Devin, what do you got here for most outstanding wrestler? wrestler number, excuse me. number three, I went with Utami Hayashida. Again, her and Shiori, the first one was my second favorite match of the year. And in tags and everything, she just carried herself like such a star and was really a great performer. Number two is kind of a weird one. I was looking at my spreadsheet, and the person with the most four-star matches was Katsuhika Nakajima. Whenever you threw him in tags, singles, six-mans, he was always great and always just brought a great energy. And number one, of course, is Shingo Takagi. He had three of my top 10 matches of the year. He was just a fucking work rate beast. He was amazing. Even if his title run didn't really make him feel like a star, he just felt like the best wrestler on the planet night in and night out. So, yeah. Uh, Sean, what do you got here for most outstanding wrestler? So, for number three, I went with Phoenix. Uh, a little under the radar, but at, at the same time, he had a lot of fantastic matches this year. Both, you know, tag matches, the stuff he did with the Unbucks, both with his brother and with the match he had with Pac and against the Unbucks sort of in the middle of the year. And then also the incredible title match he had with Kenny Omega, which unfortunately I feel like has gotten forgotten because it happened on the same day as the, the Capitol Riot. Um <laughs> A great match, though. Please go back and watch it. It's very, it's excellent. I uh, forgot that happened the same day as the riot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, second place is for me is Will Osprey. Um, obviously, he tailed off in the second half of the year, partly due to his, you know, his injury, time off, and then you know he's. I personally haven't seen all the stuff on Strong, so I really can't comment on that. But I thought. The first half of the year for him was so strong that I really could not exclude him for at least this award. So I have him at number two. And number one was also the same one as yours, John. Uh, Shingo Takagi had an excellent in-ring in year. 
uh, top to bottom. The Come funniest. On, the Go funniest ahead. part about the riot was AEW's ratings tanked, but the NXT fan base <laughs> stayed exactly the same. Oh, yeah, <laughs> they did yeah. not care that the someone tried to overthrow the country. They were gonna yeah. fucking watch their Johnny Gargano. Uh, <laughs> Mongo, what do you got for uh, most outstanding wrestler? Okay, so number three, it's kind of incredible because this is based on like four months since I don't think I watched the second of his match matches in WWE, Brian Danielson. Uh, he comes in. I got to see the Omega match live. That was fantastic. Oh, me too, he, actually. He got, I'm sure there's at least a couple of people there. Yeah, yeah I was going to say. Okay. 20,000 people, and we made up four of them. Um, he had you know really good TV matches every week, and that you know a really good match against Miro re- a great match against Eddie and then that 60 minute draw against Hangman i i realized he had to go number 3 because i started thinking that maybe Hangman should go number 3 and i'm like i as much as i like Hangman's year Danielson like in his last four months just as good as he was 15 years ago in Ring of Honor uh number 2 Utami Hayashishida um the reason Danielson couldn't go higher is she had a full year that I cared about versus um, just four months. I, I remember when she won the title, I was kind of kind of sad. Like I, I thought uh, Mayu Iwatana had a little bit more in her. And I was like, yeah, you know, it'll be fine, I'm sure. And it's been a lot better than fine. She's been great, um, but she could not touch my number one. I thought Kenny Omega lived up to his billing as the best bout machine or whatever he wants to call himself between the Phoenix match, the barbed wire match, despite the explosion after the match being a dud was just like such a wild thing to see as a, a main event on a pay-per-view uh, in the U S and was for what it was really good. Um, he had that, you know, jungle boy match uh, that Christian match on rampage, which like, took so many people who were doubting that feud and like made them hot for it. And the, the hangman match uh, at full gear, just a really great match that just, it, it wasn't a typical AEW main event there. You know, they weren't kicking out of everything. It was one guy just establishing himself as the dominant dude. Like uh, it reminded me a lot of the uh, Okada match uh, against um, Jay White at MSG where the, the at that point the current ace of the promotion but he wasn't the champion just kills the heel dead in a really entertaining but just a dominant match that just establishes him that he is the guy and that's what hangman did there but overall i thought omega had so many great matches and also i don't know if it counts for most outstanding wrestler the, the, you know the uh the the ghostbuster stuff also great <laughs> Uh, that would be more for wrestler of the year, I think. Suit, most outstanding wrestler, if you're able to hear me and respond. I can hear you. I am trying to respond. <laughs> uh, can yeah, you hear, I can hear me? You. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Awesome. Great. Let's go. Danielson, number three. He did everything in his power to win this award in like three, four months, and it was awesome. It's good to have him in a real company again. Uh, number two, I have Kenny Omega. Uh, he had a lot of great matches this year. All four pay-per-view matches ranged from really good to excellent. Uh, I was live for two of them, uh, but still, he was very good throughout the year. And then number one, I gave this man five stars three times in six months. It is Shingo Takagi. He could have done spooky nonsense with The Fiend since July, and he still would have been my most outstanding. Shingo that is man Shingo is Shingo The Fiend. What a What a... <laughs> We're speaking it into existence. Gerard, what do you got here for most outstanding wrestler? Uh, so number three, I have Will Ospreay. Started off the year strong with the match against Okada, the match against Kojima. Wasn't so high on the New Japan Cup final, but uh, the match against Shingo at Dontaku was one of the best matches, of one of my best matches of the year. I know he missed some time, but when he returned... Uh, in North America, in the UK, he's been tearing it up. Had an incredible match against Red in House of Glory in November. He dragged Shota Umino, who was out of shape, to a four-star match in Rev Pro. And his match against Michael Oku in Rev Pro 
uh, was also great. Number two, uh, Shuri. Uh, she's been the uh, glue that's held Stardom together this year. Obviously, the great uh, matches against Hayashi Shida, but also an incredible run in the uh, Five Star Grand Prix, like the match against uh, Momo Watanabe. And number one, you know what? Uh, I know I just sort of went the opposite of suit because I just gave it to Danielson uh, because I didn't, it's been an incredible run since he came into AEW with everything. The Kingston match, the draw against Kenny, uh, the match against Minoru Suzuki, and the match against Hangman, just... And and even his sort of like squash matches against the Dark Order just sort of show how he's like the best wrestler in the world right now. Uh, Liam? So my third was uh, Yuma Aoagi. Um He dragged the corpse of Suwaga, Suwama to two great matches at the beginning of the year, had a great Japanese carnival, had a really awesome tag run with Kento. Um, he's been doing like really great work on the undercards. I feel like in terms of like in-ring generalship and performance, he's been really, really great this year. Uh, and it's sort of like an understated sort of run, but I feel like it's just been like, you know, in terms of like pure bell to bell quality, I think he's been really great. Second place goes to Katsuhiko Nakajima. Um, you know, the N1 cl- victory tournament, he had three matches, but it was three matches that were really awesome. Um, you know, he's been great in tags, he's been great in singles. You know, he's now got to the point where he's like leading the company and, you know, 35 minute main events, put him in a 15 minute kick fest, whatever works, like he he will make it work. And he's been really, really excellent in um, uh, that that role. And first place goes to Yuki Ueno. Um, that universal title reign he's had um, for the first, what was it, six or seven months of this year? Eight months? Um, you know, he had five or six really strong matches with really diverse opponents. Um, he lost he was, in August to Sasuke. Yeah, so eight months. Um, yeah, strong opponents against diverse, strong matches against diverse opponents really showed growth as a wrestler in a year. And really raise the the um the quality of the cards through his like singular performances. Paul, what do you got here for most outstanding? At number three, I have Kota Minora. Uh, yeah, I mean this has been kind of a consistent theme. It's like Dragon Gate elevating young guys, and he really more than anyone, like maybe SP Kento, but like he really feels like a guy that took like a really important next step this year. Where especially in the back half of the year, he has had some tremendous. Ass- Tremendous stuff like the uh, the King of Gate final against KZ, his Dreamgate challenge against Yamato, and then uh, just uh, last week his match with Shun Skywalker at Final Gate. At number two, it's another young guy. I have uh, Daniel Garcia. He's really kind of the shining light of the US Indies right now, where he just has he just does tremendous work uh, all over the country. Uh, like his matches with uh, J.D. Drake, his match with David Richards and AAW, his work during the uh, 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 Scenic City Invitational. And then on top of that, he also had some really, really good stuff on AEW TV as well. And then as my number one, it's a guy <laughs> where, again, just like Mongo, I didn't watch a single second of the stuff he did in uh, WWE. It's, this is really all just based on just... Stuff he's done since he debuted at All Out, it's Brian Danielson. Uh, but the body of work that he has accumulated just in that short time is just nothing short of astounding. Just great. Pretty much every match that he's had has been great. And some of the stuff that he's had has been like elite level stuff and stuff that is is going to be like very well placed on like all kinds of like match of the year lists as well. Uh, so this was the closest this award has ever been. Third place, not close to the top two, but he did finish third. Kenny Omega, 25 points, two first place votes. And then technically we had a tie, but once some once someone took it on tiebreakers. So second play, both guys had 56 points. Uh, Brian Danielson finishes second, uh, 56 points with six first place votes. And Shingo Takagi finishes first, 56 points with 10 first place votes. So first time we had a tie, but Shingo takes it on the tiebreaker. Okay, so we got three categories left, three big ones, uh, and we'll let's do tag team of the year next. We'll save match of the year, uh, and then do finish off with wrestler of the year, obviously. So Paul, start us out here with tag team of the year. Yeah. So in number three, I have the Lucha Bros, where they've just done really great stuff, uh, both in AAA as well as AEW. Uh, they had that tremendous cage match uh, with the Young Bucks at All Out. And then really just the rest of the year, they've done great stuff uh, every single time they've been in the ring. 
Uh, at number two, I have uh, Neob Shigan of May Saint Michel and Sakisama from Tokyo Doshi Pro. Uh, they've had a really great tag title reign together, and they've been incredibly entertaining and just a really good title reign that uh, ended uh, relatively recently when uh, May Saint Michel uh, mysteriously disappeared from Tokyo Doshi Pro and May Saruga turned up in the US and AEW. But aside from that, they've done really good stuff. And then at number one, I have uh, Kento Miyahara and Yuma Iyagi. Just great work all throughout the year. Uh, these guys are really, it's become very clear that Yuma Iyagi is going to be a main eventer in a promotion sooner rather than later. And his work with Kento as a team has really, really helped him develop into like an even better guy. Like he, he has already had, he has always been like a guy that has a lot of in-ring talent. But kind of being around Kento, it, it seems that actually like his charisma, like Kento's charisma, is actually starting to rub off on Yuma. And that can only mean uh, good things for all Japan going forward. Uh, Liam? So for third place, I've got the Sana Kamina, specifically the Konesuke Takeshita and Shuma Katsumata t- uh, tandem. They had a really strong tag league. They had a short but very successful um, KOD tag title reign. I'd like to note the match against Junretsu, Akiyama, and Okada as a special highlight. Um, they just had like really strong, consistent tag work, and their dynamic as like Takeshi is like the really big guy, Katsumada is the small maniac, I think works really well in a tag environment. For second place, I have Dangerous Techers. Um, they've carried the kind of shit New Japan heavyweight tag division for the best part of three years now, and this year they've finally gotten a push as the top team in the promotion. Um, you know, really, you know, they've really had tag matches against every single team in the promotion at this point. Um, and really, they're like, you know, strong matches every time based on their part. Um, and strong, like strong promo work as well. And then for first place, I have Next Stream, which is Kento Miyahara and Yuma Aoyagi. And I have basically the exact same points as Paul. All righty. Gerard, uh, tag team of the year. Uh, number three, I have Kento Miyahara and Yuma Yuma Aoyagi from All Japan. I think the only people still watching All Japan at this point are all on this podcast right now. Uh, but if they were the best part of the company uh, this year, and uh, I'm really looking forward to their uh, tag title match on the set on the third against Suwama and Shitaro Shino should be another burner. Uh, number two, I really can't believe I've gone this high with them because I don't want to like them, but yet somehow I cannot look away from young the young bucks because they're just too damn good. And number one, I went with the Lucha Brothers. I thought uh, their work in AEW was great. Most of their work, at least for the first half of the year, in AAA was great, uh, with the exception of the later stuff this year against FTR. But overall, uh, to me, they were the best tag team this year. That's because FTR sucks. Uh, (laughs) Tag team of the year, suit. Tag team of the year. So number three, I've got the Lucha Bros. Uh, I hadn't watched enough New Japan tag matches to put any of them on the list. I appreciate the effort New Japan's put into that. Um, but I put the Lucha Bros at three. They're great. Had the best match I've seen live ever. Uh, number two, uh, I forget which version of Shimizu it was. He changes his name every three weeks. But it's uh, Susumu Yokosuka and Shimizu. Um, they had a really good Twin Gate run. I really like their chemistry. Uh, they had a really good uh, double header at the Kobe World Speed Star Final against uh, Kaito Ishida and Kazuma Sakamoto. And then the next day they wrestled Benkei and Dragon Kid. So got them at two. And then number one, the Young Bucks. One of the best tag teams of all time, having what may have been their best year of their careers. I will say, though, um, they need to take some acting classes if they're going to do so much of it because, <laughs> boy, oh, boy, that is not great. Uh, Mongo, what do you got here for Tag Team of the Year? So I guess I'm, I'm going to go against two opinions in the last 30 seconds. Uh, number three, I have FTR, who anyone I who knew follow- someone voted for them. <laughs> I uh, forgot if it was you or not, but... Anyone who's following me for years knows that I always made fun of them uh, as a minor league team uh, and NXT and wasn't super hot on them coming into AEW. But I think this year they finally realized that as heels, it's their job to lie. And that when they, and since their gimmick is that like 
they don't want to have good matches. They want to have boring matches. They realize that, okay, as heels, we're, we're not actually telling the truth about that. We're going to go in and have good matches. And this year, I feel like they've had really good matches, especially against the Lucha Brothers, but also just how they go out there to eat shit against Sting. Like, eh, Sting has just been elevating so many people, and I feel like I should almost edit my vote for most uh, outstanding and put Sting in there because he's just been that good, just, like, no-selling people and just doing wacky stuff. Uh, number two, I have the Lucha Bros. Uh, they would be number one if uh, they weren't kind of broken up for the first half of the year when they were randomly like paired with Pac uh, to get random shots against the Young Bucks. But it all paid off, and that leads to the Young Bucks at number one. They had such an incredible first nine months of the year, and I like them on BTE. I think they're both very, very funny on BTE. I would just... I would watch 20 minutes of the Young Bucks just being sneaker buying dipshits for the, the entire year. But uh, as a tag team, I thought they were fantastic. Uh, just that that Mox Kingston match at um, Double or Nothing it was so good and sadly has been overshadowed by so many other matches. But I, I thought the Jericho MJF match at Revolution was really good. And Again, that entire feud against the Death Triangle and some of the, just like the stuff they've been doing with Adam Cole in the last few weeks is what kind of made me realize they have to be number one because I've seen some people posting the Young Bucks should have just kept the titles. And while I don't agree with that, I think the Lucha Bros have been really good. Uh, the Young Bucks had a fantastic year. Uh, Sean? Okay, so for my number three tag team of the year, I actually went with Darby Allen and Sting. Uh, they did not have a lot of matches this year together, but and I, while I would fully admit that th- I'm sure there were teams this year that had better in-ring years, uh, I don't think I enjoyed just pure enjoyment wise, I don't think I enjoyed a tag team more this year than Darby Allen and, and Sting every time they wrestled. It was just, their matches are always a lot of fun. Um, they, somebody else voted for them first place, so oh, them. okay. Well, they they well, made the top ten with that. So. Well, that's good. That's good. They they definitely <laughs> deserve the shout out. Uh, second, I went with the Lucha Brothers. Uh, they had a very good year, though. I guess what hurts them the most is the fact that, like uh, Mongo mentioned, that they were sort of split up for the first part of the year with you know Phoenix doing some tag team stuff with Pac, and then Penta doing some tag team stuff with Pac, and they were sort of mixing and matching the, the different death triangle pairings and uh, that, that, but they came on strong at the, at the end of the year, obviously. And then my uh, number one tag team for this year is the young bucks who, you know, had an, another year of great matches. And it, in my opinion, they are the greatest tag team of all time. And if you don't take my word for it, go read the article that case low wrote a couple years ago. Yeah. Read that article and don't read his article about did and they don't. Uh, Devin, what do you got here for Tag Team of the Year? For Tag Team of the Year, number three... Oh, hold on, I'm sorry. Number three, I had the Chaos Trio. I wasn't sure if that was allowed, but I did it anyway. Of Goto, Yoshihashi, and Ishii. Just because they had like eight or nine great it was, matches. Yeah, it was, al- it was allowed, and, and somebody else voted for them too. Let me see where they finished. They finished fifth, actually. So yeah, people, other people voted for them. I just think they really, like, they were like the core and main eventers and they did a great job at it and they had a bunch of entertaining matches. Number two, I went with the Lucha Brothers. I couldn't go any higher because like everyone else said, they weren't around for six months. But they did great in AAA and they did great in AEW and they're just awesome. I'm always a mark for teams and masks. And number one, Dangerous Techers. Just everything about them, I thought they were just like a really great classic main event tag team. And just really cool. And I enjoy their interactions with each other. Uh, so I voted here for the Young Bucks in third. Uh, you know, I'm Holy not shit. I'm not the biggest Young Bucks fan, but even I could not deny some of the stuff they were doing this year, especially the all out cage match. So this is the highest I can ever put them. Uh, but it's definitely the most I ever first of all, I like them way better as heels and baby faces because they're just naturally so obnoxious. So at least they were heels for for almost the entire year. So that helped a lot. But yeah, so I voted for the Young Bucks in third. Uh, I put Neo Bishiki Goon in second, which somebody else voted for too. So uh, that was, uh, you know, Saki Sama and May St. Michelle. Thought she was thought they were just an awesome team in Tokyo Jersey. And first place, surprising no one, I voted for the Dangerous Techers. 
Uh, you know, I just thought they had an, another great year on top of New Japan. Uh, they, you know, they were sat up with G.O.D. at the start of the year, which didn't help them. But the the whole feud with L.I.J. Uh, was one of the most, like I said earlier, some of the most fun I had watching wrestling this year. So definitely uh, the, my favorite tag team of the year. Okay, so the results here. Uh, Dangerous Techers finished third with 40 points, three first place votes. Lucha Brothers finished second, 48 points, four first place votes. And the Young Bucks ran away with it, unsurprisingly. Uh, 74 points, 11 first place votes. So they won this award for the first time since 2018. Their second time overall. Uh, Okay, let's get to match of the year. We're finally almost done here. Uh, Two awards to go. So I will start with my top three matches. Uh, Third place, I went with Tetsuya Naito versus Kota Ibushi from Wrestle Kingdom on January 4th. Uh, you know, I they had two, both these Naito Ibushi matches I thought were amazing. Uh, not their best matches ever because they have had better ones because these two are amazing wrestlers. Uh, but I thought this one was just slightly below their other match, which we'll get to in a second. But still, you know, they went out there. They they built up to the crazy shit. I like that they didn't just do start doing crazy shit immediately. But by the end of it, you know, you still had that feeling of like, okay, you just saw a Naito Ibushi match uh, with the two of them doing their normal crazy shit. Uh, second place, I went with Shingo Takagi versus Tomohiro Ishii from September 18th, also New Japan in the G1 in Osaka. Uh, you know, I thought this is, this was just like about as good of a, uh, you know, two mean guys having a, uh, no sell Puro match as you can get. I mean, this was, you know, again, for a year, I didn't have a single five-star match, which is pretty rare for me. Uh, these three were my three favorite, you know, four and three quarter star matches, uh, you know, really just outstanding professional wrestling. In first place, I went with Ibushi versus Naito again, this time from February 28th in Osaka. Uh, I've learned by now that that's a minority opinion, that most people prefer, preferred the uh, Tokyo Dome match. But, you know, I love heel Naito, and he really got to work like a heel in this match. And, you know, that's really why, you know, this match really, really appealed to me. Uh, you know, it's obviously the, the gap between this and the Wrestle Kingdom match is very small. Gave them the same rating, but this is what I voted as my match of the year. So, uh, Devin, what do you got here for your match of the year picks? Not to go too long, but first, just for like an honorable mention, I also like the castle attack match between Naito and Ibushi more. That was my number four. My number three was, I have I have three five-star matches this year. My number three was Shingo versus Ishii. I'm a huge Ishii fan. I'm a huge same, Shingo the fan. Same match I, the same match I just mentioned, right? The G1. They match. only had one this year. Oh, that was the only one? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um... Yeah, the G1 opener, main event. I thought it was just, I love that sort of fuck you, no sell, never style. I think it's great. My number two match of the year was Shiri versus Shiri. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce her name, but I love her. Versus Utami Hayashishida, which is much easier name to pronounce for some reason. And it was just, again, everything I liked, the sort of physical struggle and violence and... It helped that it was two really cool women doing it. And number one was Jay White versus Kota Ibushi because I thought it was the best American face versus heel style match I've seen in a very long time. And I just like their dynamic. And it was done in sort of like the New Japan style, even though it was a very American dynamic. And I appreciated both of them. And I like when it's a very long match, but it feels like a very short match. And that just stuck with me. Uh, Sean, what's your match of the year picks? So my third place match was Okada versus Will Ospreay from the January 4th Tokyo Dome show. Uh, For the record, I have six five-star matches this year, and this will be my number one match from New Japan. I just thought it was uh, an incredible match, and when you get those two in a big spot in the Tokyo Dome, you you can't really fail. Um, my number two match was Danielson versus Omega from Arthur Ashe Stadium, AEW. Uh, I was there live. It was an incredible match from start to finish. Would have, obviously, the live bump uh, adds to it a little bit as well. And it probably would be my number one had it not gone to a time limit draw and actually had a decisive finish. And then my number one match of the year was the Young Bucks Lucha Brothers cage match from All Out. Uh, just an incredible cage match. You know, Young Bucks, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the greatest tag team of all time. Lucha Brothers, one of the best tag teams in the world. 
and they had just an incredible cage match that had some really awesome moments and told a incredible story that culminated in the Lucha Brothers winning the titles. Uh, Mongo, your match of the year picks. Hey, Mongo. okay, my number three match of the year, the Young Bucks versus Lucha Brothers uh, cage match. Uh, just a great, great blow off to one of my favorite feuds of the year. A lot of incredible spots. Um, and I mean, one of the funny things is like that, that big uh, cross body off the top was one of like the less uh, crazy things that happened, but it was just a, a great, great visual and a, an awesome match. Uh, number two, Tam Nakano versus uh, Julia from uh, the three, three stardom anniversary show. Again, I, so another thing that's come up multiple times as I've been talking, but just w- another one of those matches that really made an impression on my ear and had a great conclusion to a story that I had been enjoying. Um, and then finally, uh, the opposite. Uh, this is kind of the beginning of a, st- or maybe the middle point of a story. Um, Brian Danielson versus Hangman Page, the hour draw from a couple weeks ago on Winter is Coming. Um, once they started the show with it, I knew this was going to an hour. When they went 10 minutes at such a high pace, I thought, maybe this isn't going an hour, but there's going to be some weird finish. And then they were 20 minutes and 30 minutes and going, maybe not 30, but when they were at 25 minutes going that same pace, I was like, they, this is going an hour, but I can't believe this is going an hour. It was like the Samoa Joe, uh, Brian Danielson draw from 2006, where it just it didn't feel like these guys could possibly do this for an hour versus like the punk draws where you can definitely see how they pace themselves and you know they work that into the story of the match this one it's amazing that they were able to go an hour and have it be as good as it was um this was fantastic i'm like i said i'm so excited for this match that i almost want to drive down the jersey and if it wasn't a pandemic right now or if the, the pandemic were even slightly less pandemic-y, I would be doing that because this match was so good. Uh, I should want to mention, too, I guess, that that would be my honorable mention match, my fourth place match, which was easily the best match in AEW history, Danielson and uh, Paige. And, you know, the only other match I went four and three quarters on this year. So definitely an outstanding match. Uh, up next, we have Suit. Suit, your match of the year picks. Uh, All right. Okay. So my... <laughs> Match of the year. Sorry, took me a second to get it's to okay. that. I just, I'm just uh, always afraid we're going to lose you. Yeah. Again. That's all. all right, number three. I've got Young Bucks versus the Lucha Brothers. Uh, it's the best match I have ever seen live. Uh, it had incredible emotion. Phoenix was bumping like a maniac, and for me personally, it was a giant emotion dump because I wasn't even sure I was going to make the show seven days prior. So. Yeah, that one, number three. Number two, Shingo Takagi versus Hiroshi Tanahashi, January 30th uh, from New Japan. From Nagoya. Uh, Yep, Nagoya. Uh, If you ask somebody, hey, what do you think Shingo Takagi versus Hiroshi Tanahashi in a New Japan main event would look like? They would say this. It was incredible. I hope they get to run it back again. And my number one, a match I would break this, break my personal scale for if I could. Uh, by the way, I went five stars on all three of these. Uh, number one, Shingo Takagi versus Will Ospreay. Um, I think this match could stand with almost any of the classics of this and modern. To be clear, because they had they had two matches. You're talking about the Duntaku oh, match? Oh, sorry, the Duntaku. title match from yeah, from Duntaku. Yeah. Okay. Yes, May fourth. Not, not the New Japan Cup final. Just to be clear. Yes, a New, <laughs> Japan, New Japan Cup uh, almost made my top 10. But yeah, uh, Shingo having the run of his life. Osprey, very good as well. Um, yeah, I'm hoping Shingo wins uh, at the Dome. He beats Okada so we can get this back at the, uh, so we can run it back at the Tokyo Dome. I think these two were incredible. And this was my match of the year. All righty, Gerard. Okay, so number three, um, I went with uh, Shingo versus Osprey from uh, May 4th at Don Taku. Uh, you know, uh, suit covered it all. Uh, just an incredible match. Uh, number two, I went with uh, Chihiro Hashimoto, Das Chisako, and Mika Iwata 
versus Meho Shizuki, Mia Momono, and Rin Katakura from the Gaiaism show on June 13th. Uh, it was an elimination match. It was an incredible, just frantic paced chaos that sort of harkened back to all of the classic tags and Joshi in the 1990s. I showed why I think Chihiro Hashimoto is one of the best wrestlers in the world. And I tell people that have only watched stardom in terms of Joshi to like check this match out to see who the best workers outside of stardom are. Because here you've got uh, Sendai Girls versus Marvelous. And it's really a great way to introduce yourself into Joshi beyond stardom. And uh, number one match, I went with Katsuhiko Nakajima versus Keno on November 28th, their 60-minute draw. Um, I don't necessarily have issues with 60-minute draws, although they can drag, but they managed to go crazy and just stiff each other for 60 minutes in an just incredible performance from both men. And so to me, it's like everything I want in my pro wrestling, even if it doesn't have a, a finish. And so it was my match of the year. Uh, Liam. So my third place match is Jun Nakayama versus Dan Shokodino from April Fool, 11th of May, April 2021 in DDT. Um, maybe a slightly unusual choice, but I feel like this was a very emotionally invested match. Um, a match where they were able to get a crowd on side and really believing in uh, a circumstance or a, you know, the result that realistically wasn't going to happen. But people were fucking biting for Dino for a good 20 minutes of that match. Um, I thought like the inventiveness and putting Jun in that environment was really, really interesting and really, really like it, it put him in the sort of fish out of water scenario that allowed him to adapt really well. Uh, in second place, I voted for Katsuhiko Nakajima versus Kano from the N1 finals. Uh, thinking about maybe I should have voted for the 60 minute draw. They were both really, really excellent. But in terms of like they, just being. They both made the top 10, by the way. Awesome. Yeah. Just in terms of like two, you know, two violent maniacs tearing at each other. Um, I thought this was like an incredible fucking, you know, duel of, you know, will and sort of violence. And then for the first place match, I voted for Jay White versus Kota Ibushi. Um, this is one of the best matches ever. And Jay White's performance this match is the single best performance I've seen by any wrestler in any match ever. Well, there you That's go. It. <laughs> uh, what do you got here, Paul? Paul? Yeah. So at number three, I have Yuma Iyagi and Kento Miyahara versus Kuma Arashi and Koji Doi from the, uh, that was the real world tag league final. Uh, so when I originally, I kind of gushed over this match when I originally uh, watched it and reviewed it for the site, but I had a bit of trouble getting into it at first because it came right after the announcement that uh, yeah, uh, Nomura would be leaving all Japan at the end of the year. So I recently rewatched it uh, in full uh, without that impression first, and it made me like the match even more. Uh, so just, and I think it also actually earned uh, Kuma Rashi and Koji Doi uh, contracts of all Japan because if the promotion still doesn't see what these two bring to the table, then I don't know what the office is doing there. Uh, as my second place match, I have Brian Danielson versus Eddie Kingston from Rampage on, uh, uh, and the, uh, that is October 27th was the date on that one. Uh, that was just a tremendous match and it was very clear kind of where kind of the inspiration for that match came from, uh, cause it's clear that, uh, Brian and Eddie kind of sat down and watched some all Japan tapes from the nineties before they had that match, cause it was just throwing bombs and dropping each other on the head for the entirety of the match and it was just great and then my number one is jay white versus kota ibushi from wrestle kingdom night two uh, it's a match that has already been talked about a lot i think maybe the only thing that i want to add onto that is that i was really hopeful that like this is gonna be kind of the year where of jay white and kota ibushi and then it turned out no that actually this was by far the peak for both of them this year and neither of them have really done all that much since then but i think especially jay white where it seemed like the world was his oyster and now he's just like on his farm hanging out with chris bay and uh, and uh tamatonga's dad whose name i forgot because it's really late here 
Uh, so yeah, Haku, exactly. <laughs> so he's just hanging out with Haku, Chris Bay, on a farm somewhere in the middle of nowhere in the US. Uli, and Uli, that's Uli what doing. He's just shooting him. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, disappointing, but nevertheless, like this was a great match and very easy to match of the year for me. So the final results here. So third place, Omega versus Danielson from AEW just beats out Osprey Shingo for third by only two points. So that finished for 22 points, one first place vote. Uh, and then Abushi versus Jay White just beats that out uh, for second place with 23 points and four first place votes. And then first place, the Young Bucks against the Lucha Brothers from AEW, 34 points with five first place votes. So it is the first non-New Japan match to win match of the year with the four straight years of New Japan. Uh, all right. So we'll end this with the wrestler of the year, uh, Paul. So again, this is in ring drawing power, star power, MVP quality, any other intangible factors you want to consider the whole shebang. What do you got here, Paul, for your wrestler of the year picks? Yeah. At number three, I have Kenny Omega for the better part of the year. A, the main event of AEW was built around him. Well, kind of all of the main event storylines were built around him and he really get, did kind of take a lot of boxes that you need for wrestler of the year there where he had great matches he was drawing money and everything it's just that like kind of by my personal preferences i had two other people that i preferred over him but i suppose being on a more objective case he probably would have been number one but again since it's a subjective award i went with two other people above him so, uh, and second place, I went with Miyu Yamashita from Tokyo Joshi Pro. Again, another person where the promotion was very clearly built around her. And she is just very clearly the ace of the promotion right now. She is carrying the promotion. She's pushed heavily by CyberFight as well as like someone that is kind of on an equal level as the other CyberFight champions as well. So just really great stuff. And I think she's kind of going to be the person that is kind of going to lead Tokyo Joshi into another promo into another period of growth as well. And then in my number one, I have Shingo Takagi because he's just been the guy that has kept New Japan together as best as he can. Obviously, he cannot be in every match on the show because otherwise a lot of New Japan shows this year wouldn't have been a lot better than they were. But whenever he went into the ring, he just delivered. He's kind of gone to a level that I don't think a lot of people would have expected him to be going to in New Japan because New Japan generally doesn't push outside people that came up outside of New Japan as much as they have pushed Shingo. Now, some of that they were obviously kind of forced into, but they still kind of pulled the trigger on him very heavily and have just kind of had him carry that belt for a long while and bring stability to the promotion in a very turbulent time. All righty. Uh, Liam, what do you got here for wrestler of the year? So for third place, I voted for El Desperado. Um, maybe this is because I like New Japan juniors more than New Japan heavies, but I think New uh, Desperado really carried the company a lot, both like across the, um, across like all of the year. Uh, and it was just like super impressive. His like elevation to the, like the one B junior spot. And I hope that elevation continues going into next year. For second place, I have Jun Nakayama. Um, I feel like his KOD reign in the first half of the year was really, really strong and had lots of different um, sort of, you know, varied opponents and varied, um, you know, varied matches. I also think his role in bringing up um, sort of the next sort of crop of DDT rookies or trainees um, has been sort of understated a little bit. And I feel like um, his role in bringing Okatani to a new level in really fueling Watase's sort of rise and now he's going to be used to um, bring uh, Yuya Kuroku to a new level. Um, I feel like that's been really understated. And I think that's a really important thing for sort of his role in that company. He's a really, he's like a, the most valuable player in that in DDT for this year. And then for first place, I voted for Katsuhiko Nakajima. What can I say? This guy is so fucking good. He's one of the five best in ring workers in the world. He's got off the wall charisma at this point. His character work is dialed in and he's slowly evolving into a new character now. There's some really interesting character traits from today's Budokan show. That he's starting to show, which shows like he's continuing to grow. This guy's a, you know, he's nearly a 20 year vet at this point. He debuted in, you know, 18 years ago and he's in his early 30s. This dude is fucking unreal and he's, you know, having an all time reign, all time, you know, all time run. Uh, Gerard, wrestler of the year. 
Uh, so number three, I went with uh, Shingo Takagi. He carried um, New Japan on his back this year, called upon upon a, in a dark time for the company, and he uh, lived up to the role. And I actually kind of hope that he emerges uh, from Wrestle Kingdom still the champion. Uh, number two, uh, Brian Danielson. Uh, I mean, I think we've already said a lot about what he's done to AEW since debuting in September. He's brought it to a whole new level. But let's not also forget he saved WrestleMania this year because nobody gave a shit about Roman Reigns versus Edge. And uh, number one, uh, I have go with Utami Hayashishida. Uh, I mean, she is only 23 years old. She debuted in, I think, like... Uh, late 2018 so only three years in the business she was the face of the company during its huge expansion in 2021 and she lived up uh to the role and just had an incredible year uh up next we've got <laughs> sorry the order crashed on me it's suit suit what do you got here hello so number three for my wrestler of the year uh i cheated and i put a tag team i put the young bucks um, they were so pivotal in like so many of those dynamite matches being good. They, you could always count on them on to have like a very good, like tag title defense or a good trios match. And then, you know, their match quality was great and they played a part in the big feud of the year, which I'll get to later on my list. So I got the young bucks at three. If I did have to pick a singles for this. I'd pick either Darby Allen or Shun Skywalker for that. Uh, number two, I had Shingo Takagi. Uh, I don't know what New Japan this year would look like without Shingo because I wouldn't have watched uh, most of it. Uh, I gave him three five-star matches on the year. He's been the top champion in New Japan for most of the year, and he's been one of the lone points of high interest in the company domestically, You know, which isn't their fault, yada, 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 we get it. And then my number one wrestler of the year is one Ken Omega, a.k.a. The Gamer. Uh, he completed a defining feud in his home company's history while popping business in two other ones to boot without the full use of his shoulders. Um, his work's been great. Phoenix match, the Moxley match, Danielson Page, so much in between. I think he's got a baby face run coming once he gets back. And I think he's only scratched the surface of what he's going to mean to AEW going forward. But I think he, as the heel champion, I think he was the 2021 MVP wrestler of the year. Uh, Mongo wrestler of the year. Well, if I were being objective, completely objective, which I always am, but if I were being even more objective, I think number three would have to be Shingo because I mean, New Japan would be, I have no idea where it would be without him, but I also dropped New Japan World for the first time since it started this year, where I did not drop Stardom World because Stardom has been great, and Tam Nakano is a big part of that. She headlined their massive Budokan anniversary show, so she gets my number three. Utami Hayashishida gets number two for carrying the company a little a little bit more than Tam did this year uh being overall like a you know a better in-ring wrestler and just having a phenomenal reign um and then finally uh, number 1 Kenny Omega I mean just look at some of the weekly viewership that Impact has had the last uh, couple months <laughs> just look at that and then look at their viewership when Kenny had the title um I mean and even I don't blame I don't blame Kenny's absence for this, but you know, even even AEW's ratings sank a little bit when he was gone. It's probably a little bit more to do with the the cursed NHL, but um, as as I watched the Winter Classic, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, their pay per views did really well. Like Revolution with that Moxley barbed wire match did this huge buy rate for them, and then you know they they come back and do that big number for. Um, full gear off of just almost entirely that build for him and hangman um just great stuff for business and i've already talked that you know i think he was by far the most outstanding wrestler too so he's my wrestler of the year uh sean wrestler of the year so for my number three i went with brian danielson um obviously his run in AEW has been pretty stellar so far 
and Gerard stole the point that I was going to make that in terms of, you know, wrestler of the year MVP discussions, uh, Danielson has the feather in his cap that he, for the second, for the second time in, I guess, seven years was called in to save the WrestleMania main event. So again, that's a nice little feather in his cap, but the fact that he was, you know, MIA for four months of the year uh, definitely hurts his case in my view, uh, just because you know there was four months where he was not active. Uh, number two was Shingo Takagi, uh, mainly just based on the fact that you know he was clearly the best wrestler in New Japan this year, uh, from you know January to December, incredible year, won the championship and all that stuff. So Shingo, easy number two, and then my number one is Kenny Omega. Uh, you know, AEW champion for the majority of the year. Uh, not as many great matches as someone like Shingo, though he did have a number of really stellar matches. And then in terms of the business side, you know, he, was, he did play a role in Impact's numbers going up for a period there, and he did help them out a little bit when he was there. And uh, and yeah, he, the AEW saw a lot of success while he was champion, so he was an easy number one for me this year. Devin? <clears throat> number three, I went through Tommy Hayashida because Stardom was on a roll and she was the ace. She was fantastic. Number two, I didn't go with Shingo for New Japan. I went with Naito because I felt like the beginning of the year was really structured around him. Then he had the tag feuds that sort of carried the B shows. And I feel like just a lot of the year was LIJ centric and more in general. So I went with him. I don't know if you could hear the sirens in the background. Oh yeah. It went, from, it. it went from your house to my house or from my house to your house. I should say I was just getting, the uh, that's very fast. Yeah. yeah. Um, and number one, they're both in New York. I they mentioned, know. <laughs> yeah, he's in the, he's in the Bronx. I'm I, I, they're in the Bronx. Yep. They're in the Bronx. Yeah. So we're in opposite ends. Um, number one, I think I mentioned I had COVID. And like the brain <laughs> fog was pretty heavy, so I accidentally wrote John Moxley you're, you're when I'm Kenny Omega. Oh, that's why you voted for Moxley? Yes, because I didn't well, know what year it was. I thought it was 2020. Well, he, <laughs> that got him on the top ten because you were the only vote. But his first play, he was because I made a mistake. I was like, no, yeah. Moxley was 2020, and I didn't correct it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So COVID <laughs> put Moxley in the top ten. Well, it just made the the Kenny versus Shingo closer. So. The overall top three, uh, Brian Danielson in third with 34 points, two first place votes, and then these two were the only two in contention the whole way. Shingo finished second, 56 points, six first place votes, and Kenny Omega finished first, 59 points, nine first place votes. All right, folks. So if you want to see the results in more detail, the top 10 for every award and all that, uh, that will be up on the Voice of Wrestling site probably a day or two after this goes up. So maybe by the time you're reading this or you're listening to this, but I usually like to post it. A little after. Um, let's quickly, because uh, this episode has been a real dog to record with all the uh, audio issues. Everybody quickly give some plugs and wrap things up. Devin, go ahead. Uh, you, again, it's been three hours. Even I want to go home. So you could, uh, I can imagine people listening to this. Uh, so just follow me on Twitter. My Twitter ad is more than meet joy. Yeah. Gerard? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Gerard DiTrolio. I have a ton of stuff up on the, the Voices of Wrestling website. I have an All Japan year in review. I have a preview of the upcoming All Japan shows that start tonight and this weekend. And I have a review of today's Zero One show. And then I will have reviews of the two All Japan Cork and Hall shows this weekend. So there's lots to check out there. Liam. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Liam D. McCann. I think there's some other schools in there. And go and read Gerard's stuff. It's really, really good. Mongo. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Mongo underscore ebooks. Uh, I know a big surprise. Um, also, hopefully soon I'll be relaunching the Monumental podcast for random TNA history and I don't know what, but I said that after I bought a house, I would finally restart the podcast. And I guess I need to keep that promise. Paul, congrats on the house, by the way. Thank you. Paul. Hey, yeah. So, uh, yeah, got a lot of stuff coming up uh, on the website soon. Uh, in theory, I wanted to write a review for the Noah show that went down today. 
but unfortunately I partied until 4 a.m. yesterday and was nursing a bad hangover that I really only got over like an hour before we started to record. So I haven't had time yet to watch the show. So watch out for that uh, going up hopefully tomorrow. And in other ways, I will also be reviewing uh, Wrestle Kingdom as well. So uh, look out for that one as well. And uh, we'll see. Maybe there's something else that might come up later this month on the website as well. But I don't really want to give any further information on that for now while I'm still kind of planning everything. So we'll see about that. You sound so tired, buddy. I'm sorry. <laughs> because it must be like 1 a.m. over there. No, it's 2 a.m. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Sean. All right. You can follow me on Twitter at SACDOR2994. Uh, and in terms of my voices of wrestling work, uh, Suit Williams and I will be reviewing the day one pay per view, which has already started. Yeah. Which, is, yeah, which has already started. So as soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to go. And heat someone up. was already injured. Someone's yes. injured? Yeah, Rich, Rich Holland broke his nose on the pre-show but that doesn't matter um <laughs> i don't even know I'm, who that is honestly. yeah i'm going look, to go look i just need to say they need to fire that unsafe job or ricochet and <laughs> then maybe some other promotions might hire him i don't know but like i think w should really just like just get get this guy out of there all right anyway yeah. i'm going to go <laughs> sean it's like get the fuck out of here paul i got day one to review well, well, actually, actually, no. It's more the fact that I have leftover Chinese food waiting for me, and I haven't eaten dinner yet. So the way you said that, anyway, I have to, I don't, like you, you totally know something. WWE yeah. stinks. We all know this, but I, I'm, I volunteered, so I'll okay. The show. Enjoy the show. Enjoy the show, Sean. Uh, Sue, you're the last one. If your connection can handle it. At Suit Williams on Twitter, you can check out my Brock Lesnar retrospective series, the Brockumentary, uh, where I look at Brock Lesnar's first run in the WWE with quotes from his book, uh, Death Clutch. Uh, you can check that out at voicetherestling.com. Uh, I will also be reviewing day one with Sean. Uh, the, first, the bell for the first match has not rung yet, so we're fine there. Uh, but uh, what, what, yeah. What the fuck? What are they doing? It's like entrances and recaps oh, of course uh anyway so folks you can follow us on twitter at wrestle omakase wrestling wouldn't fit uh i don't know what our next episode is going to be um it's not going to be wrestle kingdom so we're going to break that streak because i'll be in las vegas hopefully not getting omicron uh <laughs> going to those hockey games so if i survive that trip when i get back uh on friday i'll have a lot of wrestling catch up to do and then we'll see about the next episode i really got to I'm kind of going to plan out the schedule for for the start of 2022 after I get back. I'm going to worry about it, you know, after I get back from my little vacation. Again, if I survive. So, uh, thank you as always for listening, everybody. Uh, thanks for sticking with us another year. And we will see you next time.